Team Fortress 2 is one of Valve's defining games, with a community so strong that it has lasted years. We've been through thick and thin, between update droughts and god knows what else, but one thing that has stood the test of time is the ever-expanding plethora of community-created content, from the hats and weapons to the game modes and maps. But recently I've taken quite an interest in the more obscure side of TF2, exploring empty servers running maps that have seen it all. So, I've decided to make something big. Me, along with a team of hardcore TF2 veterans, have compiled an iceberg chart that accurately places the most well-known to the most nostalgic and obscure community maps into tiers that descend by obscurity. Of course, with such a vast ocean of content created through the years, we can't collect and explain every single one of them. But we've done our best in deciding which maps will prove your knowledge as well as nostalgia. Of course, some may think that a map should be in a different tier than it is, so a light disclaimer that this list was made subjectively, but collectively, on the gathering of these maps, as well as the ranking in their obscurity. But enough talk, we've got a huge list to dive straight into. I'll be covering each tier from tier 1 all the way down to tier 6, giving a brief but informative explanation on the map itself, as well as its history. Ready? Let's go. To start us off in Tier 1 is a map considered by many to be the most popular community map in Team Fortress 2 ever created. CP Orange by itself is nothing to really be impressed by, as its basic layout and default textures provide something that isn't too particularly interesting to look at, but many play it for its simple yet nostalgic gameplay. It is a control map with 5 points, one being right in front of the large ramp spawn, another to the side of the corner, and the main central point on top of the extremely recognisable tower. But for a map as straightforward as Orange, its history is quite expansive, and it goes as far back as the times before TF2 was even released. Let's take a look. Orange is the map we've all come to love is based on a map titled DoD BSL for Day of Defeat, an old Valve game that I'd say isn't as well known as the rest of Valve's beloved IPs, but used to have a considerably large following before the days of TF2, and even a community that continues to enjoy the game nowadays. The original map was created by a user named BSL, sparking quite an interest in the hunt for the true original creator of such a famous piece of work. Sometime during development, DoD BSL was retitled to DoD Orange, being a very popular map within the Day of Defeat community, even following the game to its source remake later in the years. But with the release of TF2, a mapper named White Wolf X had the idea to port the Day of Defeat classic to TF2, with the promise of having their name inscribed in Legacy for providing the game with some of its first custom content. The map was remade to suit TF2's style of gameplay, with the addition of control points and a higher player count, releasing just 9 days after the launch of the game. Unsurprisingly, Orange was a huge success. Even at the start of TF2's life, it spanned many, many remakes, with perhaps the most recognisable being CP Orange X3 by map creator GGODD2. Even nowadays, new players are introduced to CP Orange by just a quick search of the community server browser, proving that Orange has cemented its story as one of TF2's finest. But as you can probably tell, the map shows its time well. Despite the many remakes, it still features quite a barren play space with long sightlines and broken spawn points. However, that's beside the point. Many still love Orange for the nostalgia as well as the casual and relaxed gameplay it can offer even 15 years later. Mario Kart is yet another timeless TF2 classic that stands as one of the most popular community created maps of all time, being created on January 18th, 2008 by a popular map creator back in the day named Xenon. Xenon was responsible for a multitude of classic maps also featured on this list, with Mario Kart undoubtedly being their most recognisable. In a huge contrast to the previous entry, Mario Kart in its design is a very flashy and trippy map, with all sorts of Rainbow Mario textures and popular old school memes. More specifically, Xenon's maps were particularly liked amongst the 4chan crowd, a community that was fond of TF2 when it was in its infancy, as we can most definitely see with his other works such as Hubble Hotel. Practically everything we can see on Mario Kart is very reminiscent of its time, and that's a big factor as to why people still love to play it even nowadays. Throughout the years, Mario Kart as a map has been home to many remakes and additions, with new versions and remixes being created to further adapt new atmospheres and different game modes. I even struggled to find a specific game mode for the map when I put it on the iceberg, as it basically has a version for everything. 
the most popular ones being deathmatch and control points. But despite the most evident history told through its timeless design, Mario Kart holds a place in the hearts of many TF2 players for a lot of reasons. Primarily, the map was used in the classic Kitty 706 Gmod video Team Fabulous 2, a video which actually holds the world record for the most viewed TF2 machinima. This video stands with such a warm and legendary status in the community, with remakes being created honouring the work of the genius and beloved creator behind it. With such a lasting legacy by its side, it's safe to say that Mario Kart will reign to be one of TF2's most played and most beloved maps to date. Our next entry on Tier 1 is a map that has stood strong since its release over a decade ago, arguably being the most well-known trade-specific map ever created for Team Fortress 2. Trade Plaza, in its simplest original form, is a very straightforward map consisting of two team spawns that connect in a spacious centre room. Along with the world's worst sniper sightlines ever made, we have a pool, palm trees, football goals, and a large outdoor 2007-esque F-Zero track for some reason. The earliest upload of Trade Plaza was in Game Banana, submitted on October 1st, 2010, by a username TAOTD. This strange username actually stands for the Asylum of the Devatory, an especially long screen name for a quiet user in the early TF2 map developing sphere, destined to make TF2's first ever trade map. Despite the simplistic features of the final product, Asylum had planned the map to feature much more of an interactable and aesthetically pleasing space, with quote, a mall featuring several items on display. Although never turning out the way they expected due to time constraints and the prize of bragging rights laying on the horizon, Trade Plaza would be the template of dozens of remakes to come through the years by other developers attempting to give the map a little more life. And give it life they did. Even as recently as this year, developers are still adding new features to the map, such as new areas, assets, and an expanded play area, which is definitely what this map needs. While not having the richest history in its original development and submission, Trade Plaza has definitely held up as a product of its time, being featured in many Gmod Machinima classics like ST Black ST's Vicious Cycle of Trade Plaza and General Wall 70's Average Day in Trade Plaza. I wish I could say a little more about this classic map, but I'm sure that its appearance alone on this chart says a lot to many of you. Jump Academy as a collective has always been a staple figure in every area of TF2, from its status as a helping hand in a welcoming community, to a community server that provides help with one of the defining mechanics of TF2, explosive jumping. Throughout its years, Jump Academy has gone through a couple of home maps that feature courses varying in difficulty for newcomers to veterans. However, Jump Academy Classic, or simply just Jump Academy, deserves its spot on Tier 1 for its legendary status as the training ground for many expert jumpers, as well as a map that holds up to its prime even today. For such a well-known map, it's quite obvious that the history had to be rich. And for that reason, I actually reached out to the developer of Jump Academy Classic, Chris. Yep, the original home map that has been the face of the community for many, many years finally has a story to tell. Chris told me that he began working on Jump Academy Classic sometime around early April 2014, a few months after the community was founded, releasing its first beta build that same July. Apparently the map was entirely a solo project, with help from additional members through contributions with assets like textures, bug testing beta builds, and so on. Bear in mind, this was back when Jump Academy was only a small community of around 8-12 to 12 people, composed of long-time regulars, trying out Chris's map through a special 24-7 server, rented specifically to test developmental builds. I asked Chris a couple of questions, such as the specific circumstances he developed the map under, as well as how he developed the courses to work so well with different skill groups of rocket jumpers. And here's what he had to say. As for the courses, I think it was just dumb luck it was designed so well. But really though, I was pretty much a beginner jumper when I made the map, and me learning the jump came from certain beginner focused maps that in my opinion weren't beginner friendly at all. Mostly because if you weren't in the mindset of bashing your head against a brick wall for hours, the maps were too hard, or did a bad job introducing jumpers to certain techniques you would come across often in other jump maps. So after jumping for a few months, I had some ideas of how to make jumps from my map that could be enjoyed by people who were casually learning how to jump. And once in a while, when I check by the Jump Academy map, I can see that a lot of new jumpers make lots of progress through each course, and I couldn't be happier to see that in action. The other thing I think that made the Jump Academy map so well designed, was each course was focused exclusively on a certain technique to jumping, such as wall jumping and wall course, etc. Starting off simple with the actual technique itself, then gradually increase the difficulty by throwing in a few twists, related to the technique on that particular course, allowing the jumper to fully familiarise themselves with one or two techniques at a time, before moving over to the next course. Rocket jumping has an incredible depth to it, with its many techniques you can pull off, many of them not easy to grasp, when the only experience of jumping they got is jumping up to the snapper nest in 2 fort. And since nearly all jump maps expect the player to be familiar with most of the easier techniques, it becomes a hurdle having to learn them back to back when playing on jump maps, something I wanted to remedy with my map. 
All in all, Trump Academy servers are arguably the driving force between education and TF2 for one of the most beautifully crafted techniques in gaming history. It's with a community like Jump Academy and the expertly crafted maps that new players and veterans alike can come together to play. Thank you to Chris for not only his extensive information and description about the development of Jump Academy, but the development itself of one of our favourite maps. We all know you deserve it. TL Walkway is one of those maps that all of us know and have probably played, but we don't really think about it until we use it. Regardless, it's all the way at the top because of its universally accepted status of being THE testing map. Design-wise, it has everything you need to test your TF2 skills. Featuring fully customizable bots that will endlessly walk down the main track, you can test weapon mechanics, headshots, explosive jumps, general aiming, and much more. Besides the main area of the map, there are additional areas, such as the sentry room to help with nest control, and even a few little secrets scattered around. I actually expected TL Walkway to be a much more recent map than it is, but it was uploaded to Game Banana on August 18th, 2009 by users Washi Pato and WiseGuy149 to a great reception. As I mentioned, it is quite literally regarded as the prime TF2 trading map due to its fame and practicality. If you haven't tried it before, you've most definitely heard of it. In fact, the TF2 team themselves even mentioned the map in a blog post from back in 2009. Other than this, TL Walkway definitely deserves its place as one of TF2's most known. I know this entry being placed in Tier 1 may seem strange, but I decided that along with TL Walkway, MGE Training is another one of those maps that deserves its place for just how much usefulness it offers to players. MGE, or My Gaming Edge, is the unofficial 1v1 mod for TF2, giving two players an arena to fight one-on-one -on -one until someone emerges victorious with the most rounds won. Now, I've placed this entry here as more of a blanket term for the entirety of MGE in TF2 and the different maps that come along with it, but I'll argue that MGE Training is the most well-known out of the bunch, as it features the most content as well as being the flagship map for the mod. Within the map, players can choose between a variety of shortened official maps as well as miscellaneous arenas, designed for two players to begin their match. The original MGE mod was created by a popular TF2 player named Lange, with the classic MGE Training maps being created by users CB and Swati. The thing is, MGE was more than just a name for a mod. It was in fact the name of an organisation of users making competitive themed content, such as guides and videos as well as of course mods and maps. Despite my search however, I couldn't pin down a specific date the MGE mod or map was created, although I did find that the My Gaming Edge group went defunct after the 8th of December 2011, one year after their creation. Using this, I can safely say that MGE was definitely in its early years sometime around 2010 or 2009 or even earlier. If any of you know about this, please tell me about it. I might even make a video on it in the future, since there is a lot of interesting as well as confusing lore surrounding MGE. Starting off tier 2 is a map that many of you will know, but I feel it deserves its place in the next tier down for its niche, despite its popularity. JL Minecraft DYNF is a map for the Jailbreak game mode, originally being developed for TF2, but has since been ported to other games such as Pavlov VR for its memorable design and history. The map consists of everything you'd need for a jailbreak map, featuring prisoner cells, mini-games, a warden's office, and many little secrets, such as the TARDIS easter egg and the infamous obstacle course escape route. Of course the most evident part of this map is the obvious Minecraft theme to everything, but I'm sure we can all agree that this is practically normal community map design by now. If you're particularly familiar with Jailbreak as a game mode, especially on TF2, you've most likely played this map. I'd even go out of my way to say that this is TF2's most played Jailbreak map, although there are definitely others that are played on regular occasion, one of which we'll even get to later. The exact origin of this map is hard to pin, but from searching I can say that this was the original map submitted by a user named Theo Does Shut Up back in 2013. However, the page does state that they created this map in late 2012 for usage on a server named HopJB which coincidentally ties into a later submission on this list. We'll get to that in a bit. Strangely, I always thought this map started off under the classic Jail Minecraft DYNF name, but the original map is titled BA Jail Minecart, not Minecraft, with the owner stating that future uploads corrected this little spelling deviation. Regardless, Jail Minecraft DYNF is a map that has gone through many remakes, such as the Night versions, which are equally as popular. It continues to be used very frequently on today's Jailbreak servers under big names like Wonderland and Black Wonder. Death Run Office is a considerably well-known Death Run map, 
being in the map pool of just about any TF2 server running the mod. If you're a new Death Run player or a long time fan, chances are you've definitely played this before. As most Death Run maps go, Office has its fair share of old internet humour and unique little traps played along with particularly linear design, but a consistent and fun map that makes some good old funny Death Run rounds. I've ranked this map on tier 2 because it doesn't initially strike me as a TF2 classic, but a Death Run classic, appealing to more of a large niche instead of the whole of TF2. Personally, I would say that DR Office is quite famous, or infamous depending on how you view it, for being one of those maps to popularise the endgame minigames that runners can choose to play for getting all the way through the course. Specifically, the 9 corner minigame is quite a trademark feature of DR Office, where the colours appear and the squares disappear, you know the one, and I've literally never seen a player pick anything else. It can get a bit annoying. Looking at the submission on Game Banana, DR Office is an old map, being uploaded on April 9th, 2012, by a user named Extra, and I'd say it suits its age well. Weirdly, however, it's been uploaded under the VSH prefix, making it a Sex and Hail map for some reason. I've genuinely never seen a Sex and Hail server run this map, but that may just be on today's servers. Since the Death Run game mode is a branch of VSH, using Hail for being the death, I suppose the map developer was going for more of a hybrid between Death Run and VSH, as evidenced by this small blurb here under the thumbnails. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm probably wrong. At the end of the day, DR Office serves as a grandparent to the Death Run maps of today, providing a basis of map design that mixes memes and minigames with difficulty and skill. A bona fide trade server classic, as well as a nostalgic map where many have spent their early TF2 days messing around, Trade Minecraft Neon stands to be one of the pioneers of the massive subculture of TF2, that is the Minecraft trading scene. Not only does this map feature on the namesake servers of Neon Heights, but it also runs on many other Minecraft trade servers as the one map that has it all. It has remained vastly popular throughout the years because of the sheer amount of content and playability in its design, an example being the notably difficult parkour courses that many have associated this map with, along with different dimensions, map events, boxing arenas, minecart rails, mini games, easter eggs and just so much more. Personally, this is one of my favourite maps in TF2 to kick back and mess around in, simply just because of the stuff there is to do. However, the history of Trade Minecraft Neon is pretty convoluted. As mentioned already, the map is the wonder child of TF2 server Neon Heights, being developed by the owner of the server franchise under the same name. But the history of the map also follows closely in tandem with the upbringing of the original servers to begin with. It all began in late 2011, when Neon Heights himself purchased a server with the intention of hosting popular community trade maps at the time, eventually beginning to develop maps of their own in an attempt to bring in a larger player base. It was at this time that Trade Iron Rain Game Center was developed, a map that I had genuinely never heard of before. The zero results on Google leading me to believe this map was made for a close-knit community Neon Heights had built at the time of its development. Regardless, with the popularity of Minecraft taking over the internet, and with Game Center losing its functionality through several new updates, Neon Heights began work on the map we all know and love. The development of the new map began small, but with assistance from beta testers and countless revisions and new versions, the map grew into what it is today, and the Neon Heights name had its place cemented in TF2 trade history. TF2 Wear is the ever so beloved minigame Gauntlet game mode for TF2, based off of the Nintendo WarioWare games, which follow the exact same premise. It's a community mod classic, putting players into a crazy rush of short Mario themed minigames to earn the most points out of all and win the round. Genuinely, I am not lying when I say that this game mode has it all. There are go-kart courses, class-specific brawls to the death, bowser ball tossing, and just, you have to play it if you haven't already, it's so much fun. But TF2 Wear wasn't always the most content-rich, action-packed game mode it eventually became, as its creation started small and snowballed into the madness it is today, through quite a lot of work. I mean, you have to have high visions if you want to make something like TF2 into a fully playable version of this. Development on the Source Mod plugin began sometime around late 2010, releasing in January 2011 by the user Mecha the Slag. Although impressive, the game mode didn't feature many minigames at the time, and was only going to improve with more minigames and features to come through further development. However, with no updates to the game, TF2 Wear stopped functioning correctly, and progress on the plugin was abandoned by the original creator Mecha. Luckily, two years later, the project was picked up by a user named Tony Beretta, who shaped the plugin into what it is today, with over 50 unique games. We can actually see Tony's progress in revitalising the project through the YouTube channel, and compared to modern day TF2 Wear, I'd say Tony brought the plugin a hell of a long way. So why am I talking more so about the plugin than the map? Well that's simply because the two go hand in hand. I mean, you can't put the TF2 Wear map without its plugin, otherwise it would just completely break. 
Besides, I think TF2 as a whole deserves this place in tier 2, for its universal love and legacy throughout the community, for being that gamer which takes TF2 to a whole other crazy level. The entry for this map is a little different to the rest, as Koth Asheville is a community map that sticks to the core design of TF2, and can almost be recognised as an official map if not for its competitive demographic. Chances are, if you're involved in the TF2 comp scene, even just a small bit, you've at the very least heard of this map. Hell, even if you don't play a watch comp, you've probably seen this map around several videos or just background commentary gameplay. I even thought it was made by Valve for the longest time until I began researching it while making this video. Anyhow, Koth Asheville is a community king of the hill map that has been played religiously in comp scenes such as Highlander since 2012. Designed by a user named Maki, the map was originally intended for 5cp, but made its way to King of the Hill during development, and has seen several seasons in the big leagues since. The map is notable for being exceptionally designed, conforming to the feel of the game, whilst being tinkered to suit a competitive player base. It features just the right amount of pushes and holds, with a wide control point in the middle for large scale team based battles. I haven't personally played on this map before, as I've never seen it featured in a normal server, but it still holds its place on the chart for being that popular comp map that was actually developed by a community member all along. Maybe you knew that already. I sure as hell didn't. Our next death row map brings us to a fine example of the craftsmanship that goes into making modern death row maps, and the legacy that follows. Death on Bank is nothing short of an excellent map, driven by a unique map design with dynamic traps that follow a story. Yeah, a story in a death row map. The entire map follows runners as they battle death through a bank heist, on their way to steal a copy of Half-Life 3. You start outside the bank, and navigate your way through offices to locate the vault. The thing is though, and I love this aspect of the map, at the very start is a code present above the windows that the players will have to memorise in order to break into the vault and escape. Most of the time, people will just forget, and end up spewing out random numbers in an attempt to kill unassuming players. It's an oversight, but it makes the rounds 10 times funnier. Once you're in the pre-vault room though, you have to open safety deposit boxes to find a golden wrench to break the lock on the code door, and this alone is where players must put their lives on the line, because the incorrect choice will lead to your death. Getting through the vault and securing the copy, to begin to make your exit, dodging Gaben himself as well as the bank's miscellaneous security systems. Once you break out the front doors, it's up to you what happens next. Most people though just pick Street Fight and Killbind. DR Bank was originally uploaded to Game Banana on September 27, 2014 by map developer Werewolf that has it running on practically every Death Run server since its submission. If you play a lot of Skyle, you can definitely catch this map running more times than not. I'd assume it's a fan favourite by now. Anyways, the development of Death Run Bank has been nothing but smooth up until the most recent update, 3 years ago, where Werewolf is seemingly satisfied with the state of the map, or has just moved on to bigger projects. As it stands, DR Bank is a community deathrun classic that deserves its tier 2 spot due to its legacy as a fan favourite amongst avid deathrun enjoyers. A nostalgic and classic versus Saxon Hell map for many, VSH Sky High Resort is the prime example of a great VSH map with several unique twists. For starters, Sky High Resort is, of course, set in the sky, adding the huge hazard of falling to your death but at the same time adding many new ways to do big damage to hail in the process. Along with the main island featuring a control point and swimming pools, Sky High Resort has a humorous dynamic train that moves around the map and kills anyone who gets in its way, leading to some funny but annoying ways to die. Not only this, but there's also a hot air balloon that casually flies around the map, giving the potential for some sick sniper headshots, but also setting you up as a prime target if you're going against a hail who could perform a basic super jump. <sighs> Thanks arena mode. Submitted to Game Banana on January 20th, 2014 by user LSS2, Sky High Resort certainly has an extremely positive reputation, featured on basically every server running FF2 or just a base versus Saxon Hell game mode. And I can't blame them, as personally, this map is my favourite Saxon Hell map of all time. Every now and then, I just boot up TF2 and join a Sky High Resort 24 7 server. Despite this map's well deserved fame on the community end of things, I was hoping to say just a bit more about its history. As to me, this map definitely warrants a story to tell. In any case, it's a lot of fun, and if you're a hardcore VSH player, to someone who's just discovered the wonders of the game mode, I'll guarantee you know this classic. One of the more popular city spins on an official map out there, I've included CTF24 on tier 2 simply because of its well infamy. You see, this map isn't your typical 2-4 remix. It's got one glaring feature that, trust me, is hard to spot at first, but if you keep looking, you'll eventually get it. No? Okay. The map's defining feature is its incredible length. Everything else is perfect. The intel rooms, the barracks, fine. But the bridge? 
It's long. That's the joke. To be honest, with the memes aside, this map completely changes the way you play 2 Fort, giving engagements a good couple of minutes before they begin, or plunging snipers into a hellish wasteland of mouse sensitivity. Can you even snipe on this map? Please let me know. CTF 2 Fort with multiple O's, or I'll just call it 2 Fort Long, was uploaded to Game Banana with 17 O's in the name, by a familiar face some of you may know. Fellow YouTuber Humabil was actually behind this masterpiece, publishing it on April 5th, 2017. As he states in the description of the map, Two Fort Long is a postmodern statement on the current condition of map selection by players. Everyone wants to play Two Fort endlessly, so why not give them all the Two Fort they want? Surely this will sate their need. However, when the Lime Scouts and Pro Snipers join and find that their desire has gotten the best of them and the excess has ruined the gaming experience, it leads to players questioning their life choices. Why did I think this was a good idea? Who thought this would be a good idea? Why does no one like my hot pink loadout? By forcing the player to question their motives, this map aims to encourage the player to try a better game mode. Or maybe it's just a dumb joke map, IDK. Yeah, I'm sure most of us will never know. Now for the big brother of the wacky and creative maps family. PLR Higher Tower is practically the pinnacle of silly server map material. It's been covered and played by all the big names. Spiky Mikey, Muzelk, and if you ask just about anyone who frequents community servers, they'll definitely know about it. But what exactly differentiates this map from the regular high tower? Well, how about we pay attention to the name and see that the high tower in question has grown about 50 or so floors tall. Oh yeah. The thing that makes higher tower different to long two fort is the fact that its vertical ascension makes engagements way more thrilling and strange than just an elongated bridge. No shade to long two fort, of course. In general, this has to be my favorite joke official map. And TF2 makes it way better due to the fact you could literally fall off the top of the tower hundreds of meters and still be relatively fine. The Steam Workshop was graced with PLR Higher Tower by Steam user Emmy on April 6th, 2017, surprisingly just one day after Long 2 Fort was submitted. I feel like there's stronger forces at play here. Anyway, Emmy has also submitted other joke maps, like CTF2 Bind over here, or perhaps the most disturbing map of all time, Koth Rolled Up Viaduct. Like, I have genuinely never heard of this map before writing the script. I'm probably going to play that one now. Still though, Higher Tower holds a special place in the wacky community map scene for being that one silly server rotation that has players kill biting midair, or soldiers either failing impossible market gardens, or hitting the best frags of their lives. One of the two. Where do I even begin? To start, Achievement Turbo is a very old and very complex map with an even bigger history to unfold. Back in the old days of TF2, there was no way to receive new items from means such as random drops, other than the achievements that would give you the weapons. Thus, the slew of achievement maps began to pop up, giving players an easy way to obtain otherwise difficult achievements that would actually require playtime in other more casual servers. Turbo was the pinnacle of these old school maps, giving players a huge array of tools at their disposal in order to cheese their way into obtaining these specific achievements, as well as placing loads of easter eggs and little secrets into the map for players to find through exploration. The first publicly available version of Achievement Turbo was uploaded to Game Banana, or FPS Banana, all the way back in 2008, on October 28th by a user named MrC556. The initial submission gave it the name Achievement Heavy Turbo, eventually rebranding to simply Achievement Turbo once the map took on more of a general appeal to the obtainment of every achievement possible. Throughout the years, more versions of Turbo would begin to be released, with the V10 release dropping the class-specific naming conventions. V10 would eventually lead up to V13 in 2010, and V14 in late 2011. I never really knew actually how old this map was, and the countless different versions it would receive through its lifetime. There actually exists a V15, and although most servers that run Turbo seem to run the 15th version, the only information available about its existence is on a random Steam Workshop re-upload from 2019, along with the original creator's page on Game Banana, signing a link to the most recently updated version that resides on the now defunct FPS Banana. But we haven't even begun to cover the actual content of Turbo. The map itself is huge, with all sorts of rooms and areas to help obtain specific types of achievements. We spawn in a large room, with shutter doors on either side, leading to intel captures and teleports to help you get around the map. Exiting the spawn room through the main hallway, we're now in the central hub, where the majority of the rooms are located. I took a left to Medic's Pain Stations, where Medic's red surfaces indeed inflicted pain. There were also intel rooms, with the capture points being right next to the intel pickup, made for an obvious farm. I travelled back to the central hub and into the engineer and class assisted achievements section, where there was initially a large metal structure I couldn't think of a purpose for. There was also a batter up station, as well as a prefabricated buildings area where I could spawn sentries and dispensers, and also a medic performing experiments on soldiers. 
as per. Going straight ahead in the hub led me to the achievement box area, where players could box themselves in a private room to farm achievements without any hassle from others. It's also here that I could see a whole list of the available achievements at the time for each class, quite an interesting relic of the past. Other than this, I visited the most popular easter egg in the map, Pyro's house. An impressive looking house in the middle of the desert with football fields, swimming pools, and a satellite station. Having wondered if I'd seen it all yet, I went into Noclip to locate a few more little easter eggs, like this engineer and spy in a random house we could see as the thumbnail for the previous uploads. There was also the Harry Enfield room, a bunch of A-posing mercs, a frog, and a Minecraft cave. The amount of content in this map is incredible, and I won't have nearly enough time to truly cover it all in depth, but if you'd like to play it, you can download this map directly, or find a potential server running it. Debating which map is more popular out of the two achievement maps featured in this tier, it's a hard pick as to which to say. Despite this conflict, Achievement Engineer definitely stands as one of the most popularly played achievement maps even as of recent, as players like to play it for its general combat value, rather than exploration and pure nostalgia as seen with Turbo. Not to mention Turbo's sole value in collecting achievements. Upon spawning into Engineer, you're instantly placed into an idle vacuum that will suck you out into the centre of the map, allowing active players to get a quick free kill. This is where the main idea of the achievement part of the map comes from. But not only that, there's also intel that is criminally easy to capture, as well as a control point nearby. Many of these old achievement maps also contain private rooms with nothing inside. For what purpose they served, I have no idea. Map creator Saviour uploaded Achievement Engineer to Game Banana on the 7th of July 2010, obviously capturing the prime time in TF2 history to farm achievements via community servers. According to Saviour, they were particularly fond of their idle system, to farm inactive players for easy meat, as they call it. It was 2010, and we can give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Nevertheless, it's safe to say that Achievement Engineer was a huge success, as even nowadays you can catch many servers running it, sometimes with full player counts. Perhaps it's because of the simple and short map design, with many spiralling towers and corridors that allow for close and quick engagements, or something along those lines. Surf Utopia rightly holds its place as one of Surf's most beloved maps, especially in the TF2 scene, although its influence has spread to other games such as CSGO. Originally submitted all the way back in 2009, on October 9th by user Panzer Hansha, hope I said that right, Surf Utopia was definitely ahead of its time. There's just something about this map that tells me it must have been created way sooner, as it feels so modern, yet sleek and aerodynamic. Anyways, Utopia is a very good example of how a Surf map gets done right. It's linear, featuring left or right paths for the player to take, depending on their team or preference. As surf maps go though, Utopia is the go-to place for beginners and hardcore servers alike, as there really isn't much difficulty in the strafes to warrant an outrageous difficulty rating. But one feature that Utopia helped to coin within the TF2 surf map genre was the addition of an all-out team deathmatch bloodbath at the end of the course, putting players who had fallen off or made a mistake at the bottom of the barrel, while those who completed the course got special access to hide behind the walls or control dynamic traps within the arena. I have spent countless hours on this map, more than I'd like to admit, most of them shamelessly sniping through the one-way walls that finishing the course gets you to. Utopia will continue to be one of TF2's defining surf maps, if not the most recognisable one, even being listed on the TF2 wiki page for surfing under a demonstration. Wrapping up Tier 2 is a map that not only holds a special place to many long-time TF2 players, but was also a vital part of the game's history as a whole. CP Lazy Town was, in fact, the first ever community map developed for Team Fortress 2, releasing only just four days after the initial beta build sent out to people who had pre-ordered the game. On September 22nd, 2007, by username Zeta, or Zeta. To say Lazy Town is a relic of the past is an understatement, as this very map alone helped carve the way for each and every community map that ever came afterwards to bloom at their brightest. Even today, Lazy Town is played 24-7 on some servers that are at maximum player capacity 99% of the time. Even I love to play this map on occasion, trying to slip into the player queue to join a server, jump headfirst into scout, peek around a corner, get a 3 HP pot shot, and then immediately snipe to blow into smithereens by a Chris Krieg soldier. Then proceed to get held back at a choke for nearly an hour. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely adore Lazy Town, but these issues alone bring me into the more negative point about Lazy Town. You see, when TF2 was taking its baby steps, the race to develop the game's first community map was on, amongst many map developers who have previously worked with Hammer. Thus, Lazy Town was born out of a, let's just say, skewed view of how players would play the 5CP game mode. 
it generally gets quite a lot of negative feedback due to its horrendously choky points and games that last forever. For example, the point before last is an extremely small boxy corner that is only accessible from two routes, making engineers typically nest up like no tomorrow. But what many fail to see is the poor map design is exactly what players nowadays love about Lazy Town. It lets people play differently to the more breathable maps we have today and focus more on team building and learning to control pushes and chokes. Or it could just be a map that hasn't necessarily aged that well. As we jump into tier 3, we're starting to delve into the more obscure side of the chart, and it'll only get more hazy from here on out. But to start us off is an old school trade map that has definitely seen its years, with an element of mystery surrounding its trace online. Essentially, this map is a near 1 to 1 perfect remake of Goldenrod City from the Generation 2 Pokemon games, with all the textures, music, and layout of the city practically identical to the original. For how old this map is, it was quite impressive as to how much detail the developer put into making an exact copy of the original city. Like even the underground sections are the same, lighting and everything. But what intrigues me more about this map is the story of the developer themselves, as the trace of their maps online seems to be pretty thin. Although with a thorough enough search, I could definitely find their stuff, but from the surface level I had to go on a wild goose chase in order to find the original upload. Developer Frui published Goldenrod City to Game Banana for a December 21st, 2012 release, but a short search around the internet tells me that this map is a little older than it seems. Here we have a frankly adorable YouTube video in glorious 480p of a user exploring and reviewing Goldenrod City with the free version of Fraps, published earlier in October of that same year. Something tells me that Frui had little more on display in terms of their work earlier on, but something must have happened like the original hosting sites going down. Or it could just be me meaninglessly speculating. In any case, Furry continued to make cool looking replica maps like Goldenrod City, even for games such as Halo Reach, all the way up to 2016, with a video on YouTube showcasing their latest ONET project, The Starting City from Earthbound. Unfortunately, they seemed to proclaim that the community was beginning to fizzle from its glory days way back when, so the project was cancelled before anyone could really begin to play on it. It's a shame, because since then, Furry's trace of any new uploads began to fall silent. Some people just move on, I guess. And I can safely say that Goldenrod City will continue to be a sentimental classic to some. If you've been looking into the weird side of TF2 for a while, chances are you've seen this map. But for the rest of the player base, the presence of CP Cloak typically goes or went unnoticed, especially for the circumstances surrounding its existence. You see, CP Cloak isn't necessarily a community map at all. It's in fact an official map developed by Valve, most likely for testing purposes. The reason people are shocked that it stands as an official map is due to its strange and almost creepy design. Being just a single control point map that puts players in a tiny box, surrounded by a condescending view of extremely enlarged mercs, staring right into the play space. It has no health, ammo, or even resupply, and it remains a control point map with the first to capture the singular point instantly winning the round, when it could have just been king of the hill. What is going on here? As I've already mentioned, it's pretty obvious Cloak was either a map solely built to test specific features, or something that was left unfinished. The most commonly accepted theory is that Cloak was made by Valve to test the scaling of objects in a 3D skybox. As with most Source games, no clipping into a 3D skybox will obviously make your character huge to anyone playing the map as normal down below. But the name of the map itself has made others theorise that it could be a testing grounds for Cloak mechanics of the Spy, as evidenced on this Reddit thread from 2013. As the years rolled by, and more people discovered the existence of Cloak. The theories began to roll in, as well as those who considered the map to be Valve's very own TF2 creepypasta. I like that idea, so consider that my personal opinion as to why Cloak exists. But why did I include it on the list, and on tier 3 at that, despite it being an official map? Well, the mystery surrounding the map being left in the game despite its obvious testing purpose was so intriguing to me, I couldn't pass up the opportunity. And besides, the map is so out there, that anyone who doesn't know its true story will just assume it's some weird community map from an age-long past, right? I actually debated putting this map into Tier 2 for how relevant it seemed to remain throughout the years. But most of the time I hop onto TF2 and want to relive some old memories of my favourite combat surfing server, it seems to be empty. I think this map hit quite a specific niche of players through its years, but it still stands as one of the more well-known maps on Tier 3, 
Despite it growing into obscurity nowadays, if you're wondering what exactly this map is, as well as the definition of combat surfing, Surf 10X is a regular old surfing map that is pretty infamous for its bland concrete design, as well as jail system whenever players would fail a ramp. Basically, if you'd fall off into the abyss, you'd be placed into a jail where other players could farm you for free kills through a one-way wall unless you managed to escape. Surf 10X built its gameplay on more of a focus towards combat through surfing, with sections where players could battle rather than entirely focus on surfing, leaving the battling to the fallen such as Surf Utopia. Not only that, but it also has quite a lot of secrets and easter eggs that only real ones know. Where are my music room boys at? I found an old thread from 2020 on the Skyle forums, describing how much the Skyle community despises Surf 10X from playing on their servers, RTVing the map within a mere 5 minutes, and even getting to the point where they play it for a joke. To be honest, the memories I have for this map have blundered me where I disagree entirely with what this person says, but I can see where he's coming from. As the map grew older and older, a username Exer, or Rexer, would actually submit a remastered version that is the most commonly played version of this map today, rather than the original. But speaking of the original, despite my extensive searches online, I actually can't even find the classic Surf 10X complete map page, let alone the author or when the map was created. My best guess to its creation is sometime around 2011 or 2010, as evidenced by this old 480p tutorial video instructing the viewer on how to get to the secret parts of the map. Even more strangely, digging through ancient videos for the map online gave me this really old screenshot of the 10x jail in what appears to be an early build of the map before it adopted the bluish concrete design. And clicking on this screenshot leads me to one of the weirdest websites I've ever seen. Just look at this, the rabbit hole gets deeper and deeper. Anyways, I really wish I could locate the original, because this map holds a sort of rich history that has faded with time, and the lost piece of the puzzle an original upload could provide would close the books on this infamously nostalgic surf map. Just a quick note after I finished the script here, I did a bit more research and found the original version of this map uh, through mere coincidence. It turns out the Surf 10X Complete, which I thought was the original TF2 map, was actually more of a finalised version of a TF2 port of a CSS map. The original TF2 port was called Surf 10X Reload, which was a port of the Surf 10X Final for CSS, which came before it. The TF2 version was submitted in 2008 on Game Banana, uh, and I can't really seem to find an original CSS upload, but it was probably sometime before then, or maybe before TF2 was even made, which I probably think is the truth. But yeah, just a small note there, um, I was going to finish this segment more of a, you know, a mystery type thing for this map, but it seems it was found now, so, yeah. Hop JB is a bona fide jailbreak map at its best, featuring just about everything you'd need to transport the classic CSS game mode over to TF2. Surprisingly, however, for the history behind the map, its use has fallen short towards the later years of the past decade, being rarely played in map rotation against other maps such as Gel Minecraft DYNF or BAML Castle. One thing that I'll assure most of you who know of this map won't know though, and a fact that I mentioned earlier, is the creator of Gel Minecraft is actually the same creator as BA Hop JB, which reigns as TF2's first ever working jailbreak map. Submitted to Game Banana in 2013, shortly after it was created in late 2012, Theo had this to say about the map's beginnings. I made this map in late 2012 for my first TF2 community, House of Pain Jailbreak, which is the namesake of BA Jail Hop GB. This is the first functional TF2 jailbreak map in history. No one else decided to do it before me, for some odd reason. Design-wise, the map has your go-to jailbreak necessities, with your standard cells and minigames, all of which again were the first examples of these classic jailbreak items ever being imported from CSS. Jeopardy would see its TF2 debut with Hop JB, obviously setting a template for future maps to improve its design throughout the years, leading it into becoming one of the most memorable TF2 jailbreak minigames. There's so much that this map has to offer in hindsight, featuring impressive easter eggs like a fully functional DeLorean, and the Los Poyos Hermanos restaurant that I believe was remastered into a McDonald's for the future remixes of the map. As for the status of the founding group House of Pain, labelling themselves as TF2's first ever jailbreak community, they seem to go defunct in mid-2015, making the jump to a new group named Robcorp that has also seen a complete cease in activity. However, in 2018, House of Pain proclaimed that they make a return, but this statement was fruitless, being the last ever updated status of the group. Going to the website nowadays leads me to perhaps the strangest deviation from a TF2 jailbreak group I'll ever see, instead now becoming a hub for Asian gambling ads. There is nothing else on this website other than this, and uh, if you want to check out this website for yourself, don't go clicking on these links. Watergate is a map that may seem nothing out of the ordinary at first, but is in fact an extremely historical, typically undermined piece of work, not just for the community, but for the entire game of TF2 as a whole. 
In 2014, a user named Egan was a frequent player of the TF2 Arena game mode, a mode in which players must fight the opposing team in point-blank battles, keeping players dead until the last player standing is eliminated, progressing the round. He thought of ways in which he could implement the charming characteristics of Arena into a beginner-friendly and enjoyable game mode, developing several prototypes of gimmick-styled game modes that were fun, but not for very long. It was with the release of a beta game mode by Valve called Robot Destruction, where players would have to collect cores from enemy robots they destroy that would pique Egan's interests, leading him to experiment with several ways in which the game mode can be modded and remixed to become something completely unique. In the past, game modes like Kill Confirmed or Headhunter from other major titles were deemed to be impossible in TF2, due to there being no feasible way an item could drop on a player's death, leading to the confirmation and point collection of the kill. But now with robot destruction, the cores that robots would drop upon death could be repurposed into a sort of makeshift system that would instead teleport a robot to the scene of a player's death and destroy the robot automatically, making it appear that the player had dropped an item. But what does this have to do with PD Watergate? Well, the creation of Watergate came from an old TF2Maps.net mapping contest named Mercs vs Aliens, where Egan saw this as the perfect opportunity to gather public feedback about his new DIY Headhunter game mode. Creating a map inspired by an area in the Dishonored The Brigmore Witches DLC, the first prototype of Watergate was born, utilising Egan's weird twist on robot destruction, whilst including items on the map like a huge UFO that circles into the playspace, a UFO crash event in the skybox, and a boat. Hell yeah. Watergate was submitted to the contest on November 26th, 2014, in version Beta 5, eventually going on to win second place. Despite the congratulations from the community and the brief spotlight of Egan's work, the map would go on to fall silent until a feedback email from Valve got the gears turning again. Thus began the extensive engagements between Egan and Valve, with Valve asking why the map specifically ran Robot Destruction, and how Egan was limited to the Hammer Editor instead of a Source Mod plugin, where he could unleash the game mode's full potential. A potential he did indeed unleash, submitting new versions of the map now fitted with a completely customizable palette for whatever he desired to do with the game mode. These things included turning the UFO into an actual capture point to deposit the beer items players would pick up after a kill, team leaders that would dispense health, spawn detection as to not camp with your points before a capture, and so much more. With communication building stronger and stronger between Egan and Valve, and Valve actually being interested in what began as a small robot destruction remix, Watergate would end up being accepted as an official map in TF2 once Valve had decided they were more than satisfied with the results of Egan's development. Though player destruction was no longer limited to a source mod plugin, as now the mode had gone official, Egan had access to a private build of TF2 where he could create player destruction from the ground up in the game's actual code. And there you have it, the story of how a small robot destruction mod created the extremely enjoyable game mode of player destruction. Volcano was something that was originally intended to be just for jokes, but eventually spiralled into its own weird little thing that went out of control. It's a map that some will love to hate, but it's got a unique enough playstyle that it can make for some very enjoyable rounds, regardless of the constant 2010 meme feel that radiates. Literally. The design of this map is extremely red and bright, of course being featured in a volcano, with distinct LOLs in the walls that completely trash on what would have been a vibrant aesthetic for the map. To add insult to injury, the troll face song will play at random intervals for literally no reason, although I guess it was intended as a joke map after all. But what makes things confusing is that Lolcano actually has a decent and enjoyable layout, with reasonable sightlines and dynamic lava that will raise, the sort of hazard that's similar to the much later official map Megalo. Appearing on TF2Maps.net on May 19, 2010, map creator Dr. Spud took the liberty of extending the joke to the map's description that actually caught me off guard so well that I had to scrap a part of the script I was writing for it because I believed it was real. They state, Another in my line of highly competitive maps, Lolcano is on the cutting edge of serious TF2 comp action, boasting more than three years of play in ETF2L leagues. Lolcano in its current form is the culmination of feedback from hundreds of top tier pro players. It takes a back to basics approach to TF2 level design. It's a basic but strategic layout that takes time and practice to learn. There are no gimmicks to be found here. Everywhere else though, yeah, they admit it's a joke. You now have placed Cough Volcano UGC in my search history. Thanks, Dr. Spud. I wish one day I can genuinely play this map in a serious way because something about it just makes playing like that feel so much weirder and fits TF2's community feel in a way that I can't describe. Others, they don't really seem to like it, as evidenced by this thread I found online. I swear to god, I will never play Lolcano ever again. Horrible, horrible map. Maybe it gets to you after a while. 
Reservoir is one of those more subtly appreciated maps that deserves a spot in tier 3 due to its pretty specific niche little spotlight that only some may remember well. It takes a more spacious approach to VSH, featuring a huge body of water, hence the name of course, with long rafters that surround the reservoir itself, as well as a big concrete building that promotes close quarters encounters. Very scary. The thing that confuses me is, Reservoir is quite a well-like staple of VSH and FF2 for a considerably long time, and it features practically no online presence whatsoever. Like seriously, I've searched and searched to absolutely no avail. TF2maps.net is completely devoid, as well as Game Banana and the Steam Workshop. If this map had a submission available somewhere throughout its life, it probably got taken down. The only evidence online of Reservoir's existence is two old thumbnails of the map that lead to dead pages. If we look at the top of these screenshots, it appears that LSS2, the same creator behind Sky High Resort, was behind Reservoir. Also, the name used to be longer, being Shell underscore Reservoir instead of the simpler name we have now. Despite this, however, any circumstance surrounding this map existing seems to be a dead lead, as LSS2 has taken down the Reservoir page on their Game Banana profile. Hence the suggestion I made about dead links being correct. If any of you can fund the origins of VSH Reservoir, please do let me know, since maybe I could use that information someday in the future. Alas, despite continuing to be a map that's history has been lost to time, many long-time VSH players do consider Reservoir to be an enjoyable classic, as I can see with but a few comments gathered around the whole internet. I would have ranked this map lower on the list if not for its weird status of being that one map quite a lot of players do know that has practically no information on its history. Moving on though. At the start of Tier 1, I mentioned map creator Xenon with TF2 Classic Mario Kart, but here's a map that only some of you may remember, that was indeed created by the same genius map developer. Meet Cyberpunk, a map with a gorgeous aesthetic that appears to be pretty short, but is actually vastly expansive once you take a step into one of its many cluttered buildings. It's been described as claustrophobic, and for a good reason, as it literally is just an alleyway that is designed for those close quarters highs. I may go on about how Cyberpunk can be obscured to quite a number of people, but it's still a cult classic that has stayed with TF2 for long over a decade. Submitted on March 26th of 2008 on Game Banana, Cyberpunk is actually very much game modeless, and I listed it as DM Cyberpunk to keep the naming conventions concise. Besides, it has no control points or intel to capture, so Deathmatch is basically the only game mode you can play. In the early days of TF2, Xenon was on an absolute roll of producing memorable maps, and honestly Cyberpunk is really one of my favourites. Just the absolute hell of face-to-face -face combat alongside these beautifully stunning buildings that in Xenon's words, has lots of visual pollution. I think that most accurately sums up this map, and it's a shame it doesn't get played as much on servers anymore. I've really only seen it on a city server about a year or two ago, and I feel like we really need a 24-7 server for this masterpiece. Imagine a full lobby of people running around this place. Sentry nests probably around every corner. It'd be hell, but goddamn would it be fun. So to be conclusive here, Cyberpunk is one of those maps that I think is just a work of art. The gameplay and the stunning design just wraps it up to be one of those wonder maps that hasn't seen the proper light of day in a very long time. But we're not done with Xenon yet. Our next map by them is definitely one that will leave you shocked. Let's continue. Convoy is a much loved CTF map that features one of the most unique designs to a TF2 map that the time frame had ever seen. Submitted to Game Banana once again by map developer Jurain, it actually precedes many of the classic nostalgic maps with the January 22nd 2008 release date, mere months after TF2 was released to the public. Convoy is a map that's design is typically praised for its approach that took a new look to CTF, being inspired by an Unreal Tournament 2004 map called, you guessed it, Convoy. The Unreal version of Convoy bears a particularly noticeable resemblance to its TF2 alternative. However, Jurain specified that their version of Convoy was built for the ground up as its own map, not being a direct port for the sake of playing the Unreal Classic in TF2. Taking a look at the actual map, there are two large vehicles transporting missiles in what seems to be an endless road where players can go inside and explore each specific convoy to attempt to bring intel over the single connection point at the far end of the vehicles back to their base to score. However, there are two main ways to cross, on top of the bridge and actually going through it. Watching RT Games video on convoy, he actually discovered a mechanic that was put in place to prevent rocket jumping between the two trucks, propelling you backwards to make it appear like you're actually falling behind the movement of this map. Smart. The thing is, these vehicles aren't actually moving. They're making use of a 3D skybox and particle effects in order to give the illusion of movement, with falling off placing you on a conveyor belt that propels you to your death. A map that has tons of possible options for gameplay, Convoy is the place to switch things up and take a new stance to CTF, playing exclusive defense, setting up thorough perimeters on specific sides of your team's vehicle, or going guns blazing, pushing with your team through the tight squeeze on the bridge. 
With all this strategy value, it's quite a shame that I really only see Convoy being played on city servers nowadays, as I would absolutely adore playing a full-on match on this map. If any of you know any servers that have this map, as well as others I've mentioned in the map pool, please let me know so we can all hop on at some point. Trust me, I'd love it. A map that holds a specific history that is hard to believe, Vikings is a nostalgic piece of work for many with elements that definitely suit its time. It's yet again a CTF map, but it's typically described to be a map where players default into a deathmatch style of gameplay, due to the huge spacious areas most of the map consists of. Vikings is pretty similar to Convoy, in the way where there are two large team coloured vessels, where you have to cross over a narrow space in order to capture the objective. And speaking of narrow spaces, the crossing in Vikings is literally a simple wooden plank. You'd love to see it. But Vikings actually has a background that was hard for me to believe at first, as when I checked the game banana page, it was submitted on October 8, 2012. That map is way older, I thought, leading me to the description where the re-uploader stated, I have no idea who originally made this map. I had to do a Google search to find it at all. I think it may have originally been on FPS Banana at some point in the past, but for some reason isn't any more. I haven't noticed any adult content inside the map that would make anyone want to ban it or anything like that. However, the comments actually had the answer, with the user stating the map was indeed created by Xenon himself, the same person who made a lot of the classic maps we've covered previously. This map definitely doesn't fit the style of map that Xenon would go on to produce though, as it was removed sometime after its upload all the way back in December 2007, but Viking still retains that 2007-esque vibe it so strongly gives off, with its noticeably old map design that still keeps players reminiscing of its beauty days as one of the community leaders in TF2's infancy. Unlike CTF Convoy and other similar maps, I've actually never played Vikings before, but I'm told that people remember it well and keep precious memories of this map way back when. Watching gameplay on YouTube is another one of those maps that are so out there for their time that playing them nowadays would be amazing, but no server seems to ever run it. Typically considered to be our good friend Xenon's most infamous work, Harbour Hotel is the accumulation of everything old school in 4chan, compiled into hands down one of the weirdest maps I've ever played. I actually covered Harbour Hotel in one of my previous videos, and if you want to check out my initial first reactions to this beauty of a time capsule, go check it out and be bewildered along with me. Anyways, Harbour Hotel is entirely a meme map, featuring the embodiment of 4chan memes from all the way back in 2004 to 2007, which definitely lines up with this map's creation date of the same latter year. Even more so, it was actually originally created for Counter-Strike Source, being predominantly featured and assumingly developed for an old community called 4chan Party Van. If you recognise the name from TF2, it's because Xenon actually featured the van in his most popular work Mario Kart, somewhere along the track. It makes an appearance in Harbour Hotel too, just outside the main entrance. Somewhere along the way, a community called Desorum would be created, running Harbour Hotel 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. If you remember playing Harbour Hotel, I would like to say it was most likely from this server, but you can never be so sure. Anyway, quite a long time after the creation of Desirum, the server was shut down due to unexplained reasons, to be revived a while after by a group of longtime players who are still active even to this day. Again, if you see my other video, you'll remember them. But have I really even discussed the design of Harbour Hotel? It's probably best if I don't go too into detail, as there's quite a big reason as to why this map is particularly infamous. But I'll go ahead and sum it up for you anyway. It's no secret that Harbour Hotel was targeted to the more 4chan oriented side of the TF2 community, and it was predominantly the 4chaners who would come to TF2 and hang out in servers around this time period. But as the game progressed through the years, many original 4chan players would move on. So as an exceptionally evident time capsule of that era's humour, Harbour Hotel is a control point map based on the Habbo Hotel Tower, quite a popular topic at the time if you're at all familiar with the history of the internet. Regardless, Harbour Hotel isn't necessarily bound by its game mode's premise, Rather, it's a place where players can hang out or simply fight to the death, with a design completely swamped with memes. They're everywhere, on the walls of the hotel, outside in the courtyard, and even in the skybox. There's so many in fact, that I really cannot list all of them in this section alone, so if you're interested in this map, go and check out Desirum Revival, as they're sure to be running this map 24-7. But I will warn you of course, as there's a reason Harbour Hotel isn't run that much anymore on your typical city server. A lot of adult themed stuff, just saying. If you've delved into the depths of a silly service map rotation before, chances are you may have come across Wub Wub Wub. It's something different from the typical maps you'd find when searching avidly around the TF2 community map scene. Just a word of warning, my coverage of this map will get flashy due to its nature, so if you're prone to photosensitive epilepsy, please consider skipping ahead to this timestamp. Uploaded to tf2maps.net on April 1st, 2014, 
Wub 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 was the biggest April Fool's work of art that the community had ever seen in a long, long time. I personally remember playing this map many years ago, and before I started to research this video, I couldn't remember the name of the map for the life of me. Had me searching Google for TF2 dubstep map. Which leads me into the topic of discussion. Essentially, the entire map is a setup for one of the biggest EDM raves you've ever seen. Like, I'm talking Interstellar as this map will take you into outer space as well as give you a crushing headache. Upon loading in, you're greeted with an epilepsy warning, a last minute effort to warn you for the absolute limbs you're about to dive into. Walking out the spawn door, the map seems desolate and bland, an isolated warehouse with generic team coloured obstacles. What could go wrong? It's once you cap the point that things begin to derail. Speakers start to raise, dubstep intros begin to get the hype building, and before you know it, you're thrown headfirst into TF2's definition of a rave. It gets wild. And since it's the king of the hill map, every cap at the point will make the map even more nuts until the walls collapse and it's revealed that the entire map was a spaceship propelling the players into hyperspace with the sheer beats being laid down. You've got flashing colours, reds and greens, rockets that have scouts and sentry models, it's just chaos. In retrospect, Wub 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 is an experience that you simply have to try if you're able. The fact I have to give this many warnings just shows you how mental this map can devolve into, but the gameplay is just amplified with the flashing lights and giant space particles emanating around you. Take TF2, hype it up and give it litres of coffee, and you have Koth Wub Wub Wub. Just imagine a full player surf with this map, but as I said, you have to dig deep to find this map being played nowadays, and even someone who has a vivid memory of it hence a spot on tier 3. It was a joke map that had its prime and shock over 7 years ago, and now is rarely seen in map rotations. But if you ever do see it, be warned, as things can go from 0 to 100 real fast. Another map uploaded by the same creator as Koth Wub Wub Wub. I'd argue that Trainsaw Laser takes the cake is the magnum opus, but it's debatable which one is more popular out of the two. Being the first uploaded before Wub Wub Wub, Trainsaw Laser is a map that I literally can't even begin to describe in words, let alone the actual lore behind it. Yeah, this map has a lore. Now despite this map being on tier 3, quite a fair number of people actually remember it and actively call it one of their favourites. But it's always been a niche sort of map that you find on those specific occasions. Nevertheless, everything about it definitely has a story to tell, from its design to its history. Trainsaw Laser was yet again another April Fool's map uploaded by Crash, being uploaded in 2013 to tf2maps.net. A King of the Hill map by tradition, Trainsaw Laser takes heavy inspiration from a much earlier map uploaded in 2010 called Windmill Trainsaw. Quite the trend with these naming conventions, eh? This map was just weird, featuring a singular windmill that would rotate, as it does, with saw attached trains being a potential hazard to anyone who comes near. But Windmill Trainsaw wouldn't come near the chaos that Trainsaw Laser would turn out to be, as this map deserves its cult classic status for just how mental things get. Take this. You're trying to capture the point in a map style with default dev textures and weird green nuclear fluids throwing throughout. And you have the constant threat of trains that would absolutely rain hell on everyone, basically anywhere. Yeah, this map will throw everything it has at you, from exploding trains to its trademark laser that fires directly on the point at given intervals. Even more crazier is its lore which is apparently a mysterious suicidal cult to an entity known only as a train god, has been discovered in an abandoned industrial hazardous materials compound. We're not sure what they were doing or why they were doing it, but we do know that we want whatever it is they have. The dirty hippies have been driven from their homeland and into the desert where they belong. The only thing left to do is decide which team gets to claim the weird hazardous facility as their own. This map is really a fun-filled nightmare that is definitely worth the play if you can find a server that runs it. Conclusively for Trainsaw Laser, its appearance on the list really does speak for itself, as there isn't really much like it anymore with the amount of hazards players have to navigate through if they want to secure the objective. I once saw this map and played on it many years ago, but the server was dead empty and I haven't seen a single one running it since. It's a shame, because it really does appear that Trainsaw Laser is viewed very positively amongst those who know about it. I mean, Crash's April Fools maps even have their own TF2 wiki pages, strange for just how obscure they've become over the years. For our final entry on tier 3, is an appearance that seems like a strange one. I decided to include VSH Military Area for the element of how I've seen it around quite a lot throughout the years, always being in the map pool for just about any VSH or FF2 server, but I've never really considered it a popular map. If you play any of the game modes where you can encounter VSH Military Area, chances are you've most likely played it or at least seen it in a map rotation during a vote. It's, again, one of those maps which has this subtle sort of fame that isn't really ever talked about. But in contrast to the more positively received maps, like VSH Reservoir, Military Area has taken its history pretty roughly, being bested by remakes such as Military Zone that usually now takes its place. 
Although the fact is very clear, these remakes and remasters were all inspired by this one classic original. With the game banana upload on April 9th, 2011, by map developer Airman, there isn't really much to say about Military Area, other than its history of being a universally accepted VSH map that no one really ever remembers. The remakes that come from it are way more fun to play, but that doesn't mean to say that Military Area isn't memorable for being the first of its kind. It features a style of gameplay of considerably close quarters combat, which is incredibly dangerous for the Saxon Hell game mode. The trademark tower in the middle is especially useful for engineers who can build huge nests, but a good hail can take them down quickly with enough planning and sufficient skill. Other than that, there's a couple of crates scattered around, with a cabin for spawn and some rafters on the edges. Nothing really else to talk about here. All in all, Military Area may not be that memorable in its design, but it's really more memorable for its gameplay, as well as how it helped to shape the close quarters maps of VSH into the adrenaline-filled nightmares they turned out to be. Starting off tier 4 is a map that definitely deserves its ranking, based on the drug-induced chaos within it, as well as the obscurity it's fallen into throughout time, being one of those maps only an odd amount of people really know about. Although saying this, this map is one of the more so cult classic type maps in tier 4, even having retired TF2 YouTuber's star apparently play some time in the past as evidenced by this quote on the download page, as well as an unanswered question that arose on a Reddit AMA held 8 years ago. But to decide exactly how popular Nipple Twister was is not an easy feat, as any old media that arises in my search is exactly that, old media, leading me to believe that the map had its prime time of chaotic infamy before descending into a joke map lost to the deep map rotations of silly servers. Sometimes though, those maps can be the ones to hold the most memories. But enough about the map's popularity. On the 1st of April 2013, TF2Maps.net held a joke map game day, where map developer Humblebee joined in by submitting Koth underscore nipple twister. Trust me, the name is the least of your worries because this map is so utterly insane that it doesn't feature any images on its download page for the sole purpose of letting you experience it upon loading in. I can't even begin to describe to you exactly how this map is designed, because practically everything you see has its own thing going on. Of course the Nipple Twister is a King of the Hill map, where the whole atmosphere has turned purple and there are huge fish in the skybox just chilling there. Oh yeah, not to mention the gargantuan Illuminati looking pyramid, the eerily still Dolan Duck PNG, the swimming animation heavies that fly on the map at Mach 10, annihilating everything in their wake. Like, just watch this footage of me playing Nipple Twister and come to your own conclusions, because explaining what this map is, is like trying to find the meaning of life. Okay, so this is Nipple Twister, this is my first time playing this map, other than seeing it like a couple months ago. There's a lot to say about this map from just initial, uh, initial reactions. Damn it. I really do like the scenery, it's very... What the hell? What is that music? What the- Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> what the f- Yeah, that's a- Okay, he kills you. What the hell is going on? I'm gonna get flying if I fast answer. Oh my goodness, man. Where is this demo? What is go- What is this skull? Okay. The heavy spell- <laughs> <laughs> There's a moving point in the background. I think that's the point we're meant to cap. Oh, brilliant. Upon researching Nipple Twister for the Iceberg, I could have sworn I'd seen it before, as so forgetting a map like this even after briefly playing it can be considered impossible. It then struck me that I found it while searching for servers for my other exploration video, and I did consider talking about it, but the video being based on the servers meant that I had to leave discussion of Nipple Twister to an occasion like this. To conclude the segment of this glorious map, watching gameplay back, I absolutely wish that one day people could just start playing comp on this map on April Fools or something, for no reason at all. Imagine just comp commentary on this map being all serious, that a flying heavy just takes someone out. I put WoW with 6 A's on the deathmatch, because this map is so utterly random that it's impossible to play any other game mode other than deathmatch because of the lack of objectives. It's completely stupid, but not the sort of overloading chaos that Nipple Twister was. Rather, WoW consists of a giant spinning box made up of combined screen textures that players will spawn inside and be flung around all over the place due to the immense rotational energy. But WoW isn't just a one-off silly map, because it actually demonstrates quite a difficult feat to achieve in the Hammer Editor before later fixes would be introduced further into the years. You see, Funk underscore Rotate was quite a buggy function in Team Fortress 2 that would only spin anything above the actual brush itself, meaning that map developers had to get creative with extensive logic or animated objects in order to make stuff rotate in TF2. But WoW manages to function properly with these limitations by tying a physics box entity to a physics motor, 
allowing the play space to move through the players inside as well as the miscellaneous props like Half-Life 2 crates and whatnot. Another step that must be taken in order to ensure that WoW works correctly is to run the command sv underscore allow point server command always, letting the map send direct communication to your server, mainly setting sv underscore top of physics to zero, allowing for more precise game physics. And lastly, in order for the map to run on multiplayer servers at all, the host must download an info underscore observer point plugin, a feature that adds an invisible camera to the server for whatever reason, otherwise the server will just straight up crash. To further complicate things surrounding WoW, the actual origins of this map remain a mystery. If you were to search up WoW TF2 on Google, the main download page would be a Steam Workshop re-upload from 2015 that details how old the map is and all of the instructions required to run it. Helpful, but not our original upload. Having a further look leads me to this YouTube video titled Weird TF2 Map Called Woe Redone from all the way back in 2010, uploaded on December 18th. Our uploader actually tells us what the original description of Woe was, that being, quote, here is a very weird TF2 map that basically has a brain of itself, and what a small brain it is. This rather obscure map called Woe has no gravity, so basically it tosses you around in a large transparent cube. It's amusing to watch with bots on it. The 2010 uploader then ends off the description saying how they didn't make this map, and they have no idea who made it in the first place. It's strange, because with a map as intricately designed as WoW, you would have expected it to come later down the line when map developers had more of an understanding of TF2's functions and bugs. But it seems the original creator knew exactly what they were doing, and aside from the list of steps we have to complete to get the map to even function, I'll go out of my way to say that this is quite a considerable achievement in the map development scene, even considering the map's obscurity. Achievement Villain City is no quaint achievement map, having a rich history of development as well as loads of content to explore throughout countless official releases with all sorts of drastic changes. But to get to where it stands today, with its impressive size and intuitive final design, as achievement maps began to fade out of existence, Villain City went through a sort of prototype trial and error phase, with maps released before it having a part in its evolution. Allow me to explain. Map developer Invalid Vertex is a long-time creator, submitting their first map Trade MTS Harvest Fix in 2011 as a sort of small side project, and although nothing much to boast about, it was fairly impressive for a first map, and began the idea of combining an achievement map with an idle trade feel that Vertex would later build upon throughout their releases. In that same year, perhaps even immediately after the release of their first map, Vertex would begin to work on the predecessor to Villain City, a map named Achievement Villains. This would be their best work yet, a large project created for the Idle House's TF2 server that would further improve upon the achievement trade idea that they previously experimented with. Releasing on August 26, 2013, Villains was a fun and exciting map to say the least, with all the achievement map necessities like farmable objectives, but also featuring trade map elements like discos, jukeboxes and playful areas. One thing that Villains would help to bring into fruition was the efficient idea of containing all achievement farming areas within a central building, and having all of the other areas outside so players could easily differentiate as well as explore to their utmost content. After Villains was completed, Vertex began immediate work on a second version, a much larger and aesthetically pleasing map that would further build up on the efficiency of the achievement trade idea that the original villains helped to put together. With a beta build of Villain City being created not too long after the release of Villains, Vertex decided to weed out the bugs and glitches before officially releasing both the day and night versions of Villain City to Game Banana on May 7th and May 26th, 2014 respectively. Since then, Villain City has boasted a whole variety of seasonal variants, with the Halloween and Christmas versions publicly available on Game Banana alongside the original day and night releases. Moving on to the actual design of Villain City, seeing how it went through multiple previous maps to perfect that comfy achievement trade feel, it's no secret that this map has a lot to show and delve into. First things first, the main hotel in the centre of the map is where all of the achievement farming happens, an idea that carried over from the original Villain's release. Our ground floor has a payload cart with a humorously short track, as well as multiple buttons that will take you to the several floors throughout the hotel. You can choose objectives like control points or intel caps, engineer spawns for engine related achievements, a button simply letting you die, and finally a penthouse where you can check out the personalised developer rooms that are just time capsules. It's great. Once you leave the hotel and begin to explore around the city, you can encounter the ever so popular trade map disco that has a disturbing looking scout apparently manning the decks, and 2014 classics that you can dance to with your buddies. This game never ceases to impress, does it? Other than the disco, there's an outside pool, a nice looking park, a classic heavy boxing ring, rural districts, pyro tennis, and just... If you ever see this map running on a server, although it's fallen into the zero player server map rotation purgatory, give it a try. Villain City is really beautiful and every time I've played it throughout the years, it's been a blast, even by myself. What's been described as cute, cluttered, cramped and chaos, 
PL underscore Rainbow Ride is an absolute experience of a map that garnered quite the infamy around the time it was uploaded. Aside from the design being the main focal point of Rainbow Ride, and the unique literal twist of Payload, it has quite the convoluted history that features dead ends, or rather dead links. Starting off with the elephant in the room here, Rainbow Ride is no ordinary Payload map, or no ordinary design at all for that matter. It consists of mostly narrow, winding tunnels with rainbow default hammer textures and neon ambience. Navigating this map can be generally impossible at times, due to the confusing maze-like layout of the doors and points. To make it 10 times worse, however, and arguably the main factor of this map's infamy, is the payload cart that turns, twists, and defies gravity along its set path indicated by a white line that strings throughout the map. How the cart is sometimes angled means pushing it is a challenge in and of itself, not to mention the extremely choky tight squeezes that has the fate of the entire blue team decided with just a couple sticky bombs. But hey, I'll go ahead and argue that this is where the map shines. The chaos and alien design has you playing an almost different game, it's wonderful. But the history and relevancy of Rainbow Ride is a whole different story, seemingly being scattered in pieces within the TF2 community, starting from around 2011. I'd like to say its main mention online comes from a classic music video from 2015, featuring Rainbow Ride along with a bunch of other strange maps, a couple of which I've even covered on this list. Aside from the music video, Rainbow Ride is mentioned a couple times online through Reddit threads, as well as the only remaining download link on the Steam Workshop from 2015. It says that Rainbow Ride was an entry for a TF2Maps.net contest that seriously got out of hand, which is funny because there is absolutely zero surviving evidence of a Rainbow Ride TF2 Maps page at all. In fact, one of the aforementioned Reddit threads contains discussion about the map from around 2013, where a user states that the map was released almost two years ago, making the original upload date sometime in 2011. Even stranger, all of the download links OP provides the users questioning what the TF2 map's upload was, even back when the thread was published, all lead to a site named timeforfun.net, which has since gone completely defunct. Taking a look at the Wayback Machine for this website, however, leads me to snapshots from throughout the years, dating all the way back to 2004. Apparently, it seemed to be some sort of Flash Games website that for some completely random reason hosted a TF2 map repository within. The hunt for the history of these obscure maps leads me to the strangest places, I swear. All in all, Rainbow Ride is a chaotic, frenzied map that has had its history scattered through time in places you'd never thought it would reach. You can say that it's had quite the run throughout the years, but finding this map running nowadays is like finding a needle in a haystack. Taking a little break from the extensive stories behind our previously featured maps, the skating rink takes a wholesome spin on the classic CTF game mode by completely switching up the style of gameplay provided. Submitted to Game Banana by map developer Beetle on June 15th, 2011, this map had quite a simple upbringing with nothing going on for any backstory surrounding its development. But aside from the straightforward history, the skating rink's main focus is the approach it takes to gameplay and design. The entire map is, as you may have guessed, a skating rink that goes round and round in circles, propelling players through on a conveyor that, I guess kind of gives the illusion that they're skating? I don't know, you had to get creative in those days I suppose. The CTF element is introduced though in the fact that the players can't traditionally cap the intel as they would with any other map. Rather, each team has to hold the intel and make 25 successful laps around the rink to win. This is where the chaos comes in, as the sole carrier for the intelligence must be protected as they make their laps, elegantly skating and strafing in circles while they avoid gunfire from the enemy team, who are always in close proximity. The gameplay of this map seems so fun to play, just imagine trying to make even a single full lap while you have the weight of the entire enemy team right around the corner, ready to annihilate you at a moment's notice. It's a stroke of genius that relies on teamwork and coordination to get those 25 laps in as soon as possible, even displaying the intel right in front of the opposing base, so players can just swoop in and get going without any sort of notice. The only mention of the skating rink online is, of course, the original Game Banana upload, but also a slew of adorable gameplay videos from many years ago, all of which with absolutely no views at all. It's quite wholesome to see all these people playing this map, that has seemingly faded into complete obscurity nowadays, as I haven't seen a single mention of this map, other than the nostalgic tip I was given to cover it. Quite a shame, since this map has that old community map charm where they all managed to try and do something different and really make it work. Speaking of doing something different and making it work, Balloon Race was what could have been considered a bona fide TF2 game mode mod, providing a completely new and fresh game mode that unfortunately fell into a purgatory of obscurity that has had no active server running it for years. Originally releasing in October 2008 by map developer Chuckstar, Balloon Race was created one year after the initial launch of TF2. Quite an impressive feat considering that the game had only been out for a year, and people had managed to create an entirely different, community-made game mode. Even more so, Balloon Race actually precedes one of the arguably defining community game modes of ESH, of Versus Saxton Hale, being released exactly two years beforehand. 
The first balloon race version was buggy, unbalanced, and had a considerable bias towards classes, prompting negative but constructive feedback from testers on the original Game Banana upload. However, with the turning of the year brought the introduction of Balloon Race V2, and eventually V3, fixing most issues and further solidifying the game mode. But what exactly is Balloon Race and what makes it so unique? Well, as evidenced by its name, the game mode is centred around the racing of team-oriented hot air balloons in a race to capture control points before the enemy team reaches them first. At the start of the round, the balloons begin in a giant shared hangar that houses both of the team's spawns, and once the player's ball to begin the race, they can accelerate the balloon by standing at the helm where the wheel is, propelling it forward and towards the first control point. The main combat element of this game mode is the management of fights between both of the balloons, as teams must battle to stop each other from reaching the control point first, proposing a considerable risk to those driving the balloons forward. However, if the team manages to capture a control point before the enemy, their balloon will receive a speed boost, propelling them even faster towards the next objective. It should be mentioned that each balloon is fully invadable, but does give damage over time to enemy players, prompting for some pretty close quarters fights for those who can find a spot to hop aboard. Balloon Race was actually inspired by an even earlier TF2 map named Wacky Races, uploaded all the way back in August of 2008, mere months before Balloon Race would release in its first version. It features the same premise as what Balloon Race would become, with two drivable team vehicles that have to capture points before the enemy. The prominence of these unique and intuitive game modes not that long after the release of the game is so interesting to me. It's almost as if players were in a hurry to create something so unique it could cement their name in legacy for the publication of the most unique game mode TF2 had seen yet. However, unfortunately for Balloon Race, it seems that the legacy has long since turned to the history books, as any old servers that are still live that could potentially run the game mode have no active players whatsoever. An extremely old map that some may very well hold dear memories to, CP Toyfort is an old community classic that had such a unique and enjoyable design that people who used to play this map would tell you it was a definite fan favourite back when it was most prevalent. But in the words of RT Game, Toy Fort simply fell off the face of the planet, as its release was so close to the original release of TF2 itself, that players simply got a bit too bored and went looking for more new fun maps to play. With the game being in its infancy, and some would argue its golden age, the influx of new content was springing up each and every day, spoiling the oldest of players with fresh new community submissions. But even today, Toy Fort holds its own as being one of those early maps that had such a different spin. You could even say they were the predecessors of the definitive classics. The earliest release of Toy Fort I could find was in Game Banana, released on November 26th, 2007, a mere month and a half after the public launch of TF2. It's hard to say whether map creator Zeus CST and Ares CST were first-time developers, as their trail of maps dried up online shortly after the submission of Toy Fort. In fact, the only actual evidence that these guys had a mapping career is credit for Toy Fort's creation, with the game banana search queries coming up practically empty, other than listed in the credits for an old map pack and as inspiration for a Toy Soldier-themed skin mod. As we get into the actual design of Toy Fort, it's a shame to think that Zeus and Ares only made one map, as their skills and development this early in the game's life is definitely something to commend. Toy Fort's entire gimmick is its size, which gives off the illusion that players are actually tiny toy soldiers fighting in a normal sized house. In reality, of course, Toy Fort is a house designed to be vastly scaled up, letting the mercs fight under pencils, books, and even beds. Being a control point map, the control points are placed in different positions around the house, with one being in the trademark bedroom, another in the hallway, and the rest in varying rooms such as the bathroom. There's even little mouse holes in the walls that give players a nice jolt of close quarters combat, after being enveloped by huge pieces of furniture towering over them. It's really a wholesome map that shouldn't let time be its end, as it holds up even today as a classic CP map that still keeps its gimmick after so long. Carrying on the theme of miniscale maps, CTF Bedrooms 3 follows the same design premise as CP Toy Fort, with a commenter even describing it as Toy Fort on steroids. Bedrooms 3 is extremely well done, with detailed looking textures, complex lighting, and a fantastic layout that had me fooled that this was somehow a real house upon the first second I saw it. Yeah, I actually thought this was real. The surprising thing is, Bedrooms 3 was submitted to Game Banana on July 5th, 2008, not even a full year after the submission of Toy Fort let alone TF2 itself. I actually find it jaw-dropping that map developer Kiddying managed to pull off something this good looking within the first year of TF2 being publicly available. I mean, just look at this grass. Even the grass is realistic meshing, it's incredible. Taking an actual dive into the design of Bedrooms 3, we can clearly see that it holds inspiration from Toy Fort before it, building upon that gimmick of miniature mercs navigating a normal sized house that's actually just designed to be huge. But Bedrooms 3 has element upon element that had never been seen before, with some saying in the original comments that this is the best map they've seen yet. Consisting of a suburban looking street with two completely explorable houses on either end, Bedrooms 3 makes the homes actually look homely, with posters, photo frames, boxes, controllers, you name it. The attention to detail that this map had in 2008 is really something special. 
Now, as explained with Toy Fort, there are many large rooms available to rummage around with the potential for long range as well as close quarters combat. But where people noticed that bedrooms fell short was just how much they amplified this gimmick by making the map just a little too big. This means that engagements take too long to get going, or players would have to sort of restrict themselves to a specific part of the map. I can understand where these people are coming from, but in my opinion, it's really only a small nitpick that I actually think gives the map some more breathing room for strategized play. What I actually haven't mentioned yet is that Bedroom 3 has a few different versions, mainly being the CTF and CP variants. I'd like to go and say that CP was the more popular version of the map, as evidenced by the outnumbering of grainy old YouTube videos and Game Banana downloads. But really, they're interchangeable and just different ways to play the same map. Now, the version where this map really switches up is the Bite Size version, released a full year later from the original Bedrooms 3 submission. I believe what map developer Kiddying was trying to do here was pander to those people who thought that the original was way too big for serious play, restricting the play space to just the house and nothing more. But this version never really took off, showing in the end that the players didn't really care about the size of Bedrooms 3, they only wanted to mess around in huge houses. What's with only TF2 in miniature scale maps anyway? Perhaps being one of the first major examples of a TF2 map replicating another game, typically retro, Koth Mega Man was a fine demonstration of how convincing a theme you can give a map by simply adding another title's native music and textures. Basically, Mega Man is a King of the Hill map that is composed of different areas for play, each one of them being eight different robot boss arenas from the game Mega Man 6. If you haven't played Mega Man before, or simply don't know its premise, the games are based around multiple different uniquely designed platformer stages that all lead up to the boss of that specific stage. Koth Mega Man takes these stages and converts them into 3D environments, making never before seen landscapes for players to explore and battle. Although the footprint of Mega Man Online had me thrown through a loop, since I was convinced with the only publicly available release being a 2016 Workshop upload and its Game Banana counterpart, that this map wasn't as old as I might have guessed. But a quick search around old school TF2 videos leads me to find that Mega Man was indeed prevalent as far back as 2011, with the earliest mention of it being this 480p replay montage uploaded on July 8th of that year. What's kind of interesting about this video here is that it was made just months after the replay feature was introduced into TF2, meaning a lot of the videos around this time are probably exactly like Koth Mega Man is Amazing here. To be honest, there's not really much else to say about this map, other than its design serving to follow the evolution of the retro game mapping niche that a lot of TF2 maps followed throughout the years, with more modern examples being maps such as Death on PlayStation. If you really take a step back and have a look at the types of community maps that make up the sphere as we know it today, we really wouldn't be where we are without these sort of maps that break the boundaries of vanilla design to achieve something greater and greater every time. A map that follows closely in relation with our previous entry, CP Pac-Man WTF has more of a unique gameplay twist to its faithful TF2 recreation, while still featuring a one-to-one -one replica of the original game. Yeah, this map is genuinely an exact copy of Pac-Man. It's an adrenaline-boosted nightmare of close quarters encounters mixed with control points, mazes, and of course ghosts that hunt you down and mercilessly send you flying. In order to win, a team has to capture all four of the points located in the corners, but in the King of the Hill version, the point will continuously move around the map, adding to the chaos. Keeping with the theme of old maps always trying something new, I'd say Pac-Man does this excellently in having just the right mix of player versus player against player versus ghosts or map. Just imagine trying to perhaps chase down a medic that made a run for it, to instead be absolutely jump scared by a ghost. Or maybe you want to capture the control point, and you have two ghosts approaching you from each side, ready to up their kill tally to display to the entire server. If you've ever wondered how 3D Pac-Man would play, well this map is exactly that, but this time, you can't see anything coming, and you have the added benefit of even more threats. I'm making this sound like a horror movie, but with the removal of the traditional bird's eye view, and these massive ghosts, you could probably pass it up as one. The original release of CP Pac-Man was on November 30th, 2008, by map developer What the Funk, an now outdated version of the map that still maintained its one-to-one -one layout, but with some slight differences, such as 2D ghosts instead of 3D versions that would arrive in the final release. A couple months later, on March 7th, 2009, CP Pac-Man WTF Final would release, with changes including a sort of cutscene where Pac-Man himself would ascend to eat the losing team. These were definitely different times, but our map developers have only gotten better in evolving novelty maps to become some of the most impressive works of mapping I've ever seen. But even back then, you'd stop and wonder if this was even TF2. The fact that people got a functioning map of Pac-Man working in 2008 is just beyond me. Quite a short entry here, but definitely one to note, is the small TR Endif or Training Endif, which is actually a port of the original MGE training map we discussed earlier. Only now, it takes the form of its own map for those who want to play close quarters training. Personally, I've never actually played this map, as I'd only play the shorts of official maps on MGE, but the fact that these sort of maps exist is particularly unknown to many people. It's not just a port of TR Endif either, as there is a whole plethora of training maps that have gone under the radar, some of which actually have quite a considerable amount of downloads. 
but the fact that so many different training maps exist for all sorts of reasons is pretty cool to see, as I've only really ever played TL Walkway myself. Regardless, NDIF, as well as the abundance of training map submissions being buried on top of one another, is an interesting look into how much content is actually submitted to TF2, typically on the daily. Surf Akai itself has gone a long way, from what was originally an old CSS surfing map, to respective remakes on TF2 and CSGO alike. I'd even go out there to say that Akai was one of the gems that started the source surfing revolution, with more of a definitive and consistent appearance in Counter-Strike than it made in TF2. Nonetheless, Akai definitely did hold up gameplay-wise in TF2 surf, as well as it did with other titles. But as the years went by, TF2 servers began to cycle more consistently updated maps into their rotation, especially ones that began to be created solely for TF2 surf alone. That doesn't mean to say though, that Surf Akai doesn't have a story to tell, as its origins began all the way back in CS Beta 3, seven years before TF2 would be publicly released. In the year 2000, Counter-Strike would enter its Beta 3 build, where somewhere along the way, a developer named Akai would string together a map named CS underscore DEA that would never be released to the public. At this point in time, surfing had yet to be truly invented, as in May 2004, Charlie Marion Joyce would create KA underscore Killbox for CS 1.6, labelled as the world's first ever serve map. Being created only really for Joyce and his friends to mess around, there'd be an instance where the discovery was made that sliding off of a roof would let the player gain speed and strafe, prompting Joyce to whip up Hammer Editor, copy the roof and make a new map that would coin the name serve underscore the gap. With this came the development of some maps that built upon the seed that Joyce had planted, bringing surf into its infancy, where it would only grow larger as Counter-Strike took to the Source engine. That same year, CSS would release in November, and with this it brought a huge new audience to the idea that KA underscore Killbox, as well as other 1.6 maps, had experimented with. Soon enough, surfing took CSS by storm, and eventually became one of the defining aspects of Counter-Strike. It was with this new surfing idea that Akai would give map development a shot once again, releasing Surf underscore Akai on July 6th of 2006, two years after CSS was released to the public. Although featuring quite a bland palette of textures, the deaf oranges and blacks, Surf Akai would become pretty popular due to the easy surfing layout, as well as a multitude of different secrets to uncover. Determining when the TF2 port was released, however, is a challenge, as the only available upload of Akai Online is the original CSS version. Although once again, gathering from the handful of old gameplay videos, I can safely say that it was probably ported to TF2 sometime around 2011, maybe earlier, as we can see with the earliest evidence of the TF2 port being a video simply titled TF2 Surf Akai, published on April 17th, 2011. As old as Akai is, it's impressive to see that the most recent update was on the original Game Banana upload in 2012, six years after its release. You would have thought that it was one of those maps to get one version and full silent, but hey, I'd say it maintained its prime pretty well. From what was marketed as a groundbreaking new game mode, Dogbred took the existing idea of Payload and converted it into something else that garnered mixed opinions from those who played it. Released on November 13th, 2011 by Fubar FX to TF2Maps.net, Dogbred consisted of quite a short payload map, with more of a focus on short encounters rather than long sightlines. The design is reminiscent of the official art style, of course, but the main outlier in Dogbred is, of course, the Dogbred. You see, the payload cart in Dogbred is transformed into a pug that has been moulded to be a loaf of bread. Cool reskin, right? That's not even the end of it, as Dogbred's gameplay is entirely focused on there being only one car for both teams to fight over. So that means that blue team pushes and the red team pushes back. This way, both teams are considered on the offensive and the defensive at the same time, defending the current position of the car while maintaining how far forward or how far back it gets. The thing is, however, that for how novel Dogbred seemed, some players who witnessed his submission weren't that pleased with the tagline of a groundbreaking game mode. For starters, they clarified that Payload Race was the introduction of two entirely separate carts a team has to push to be the first to cap, not a single cart interactable by both teams. Apparently, this is instead what was brought up to be an already existing idea called 2TPL, or 2 Team Payload, something that I had generally never heard of before. Maps such as PL Waste and 2TPL Mine were mentioned as being the first to actually coin the idea of a payload map where two teams would be in charge of one cart, with others even saying that they hated Dogbred. And while the map developer may have taken some of the credit for the innovation behind 2 Team Payload, I feel this hate was unjustified, as Dogbred can be home to some pretty fun and exciting games that take a unique break from the original Payload.
A fine hand selected pick from the abyss that is old 4chan maps, Danson is the perfect example of everything you're probably going to see when choosing to play one of these maps. Created by Fred Dursen, or Frogu, around February 2011, CP Danson is a linear control point map with three points to capture, one being in the centre and the others just at the bottom of the team's spawn. What you may notice about Danson is the tasteful choice of textures, as we can see here with assets such as Ash Ketchup and Kanata with a No More Heroes body pillow on the long tunnel down from spawn. In the main rooms we have a Zelda CDI themed point, a normal enough looking blue striped room that eventually turns into Yuboa's Nightmare from Yue Nikki if you press this menacing looking button, and a bunch of miscellaneous eye candy in the center, including the ever so popular Harry Enfield's United States Dollar. Oh yeah, and the 2011 DJ booth. Spawning into the map itself, we're greeted with a pleasant initiation by the Tunnel Snakes from Fallout 3, describing how we're going to show the world online how much we rule by earning stupid ass achievements and chewing gum, before being dropped into a box with a discernible choice of imagery. Now upon playing this map, we all discovered a menacing looking door in the Zelda CDI room. Where could this door lead, we pondered, oblivious to the blatant warnings outside only prompting our curiosity to take a morbid twist. Before we all knew it, we piled into the Trap Lover Society one by one, to be greeted with the most hellish and absolutely channel deleting landscape I have ever been in. Like really, if I were to show even a frame of this room, that would be me gone. I'm sure the majority of you can imagine what was inside, and for those who don't, just don't get too ahead of yourselves. I think it's safe to say our curiosity wasn't so satiated after this experience. Thanks Frogu. Back in 2011, when Dancing was published, Frogu uploaded a very helpful tour video that goes over basically everything in the map from a developer point of view, with a low quality text to speech that just makes it 10 times better. Listen to this. Hello, I'm Frogu, and welcome to CP Dancing. This is the ugliest room in the entire map. What I discovered through this video though, is that apparently there was a secret room in Danson that none of us could find during normal play, where a multitude of buttons lay dormant. From what I can see, there is, yet again, another Uboa button that teleports you to the dimension, where I did actually see a scout awaiting their death when I was spectating. How did it get there? I have absolutely no idea. A fine example of a great TF2 retro game recreation, DM Booster Tower is a deathmatch map, based on the Booster Tower from the SNES Mario RPG, with its earliest upload found online on GameMaps.net around the 23rd of April 2012. DM Booster Tower is a very accurate recreation of its original source, of course deducting any mishaps that may come with recreating a 2D level into a 3D map. For starters, this map is absolutely huge. Entering at the base of the tower, there are many twists and turns and ways to ascend through launch pads and vertical chutes, prioritising close quarters encounters whilst taking quite a bit to even get into an engagement because of the maze-like structure of the tower. This is no fault of the map of course, as the booster tower itself is described to be massive with many floors, rooms, dangerous enemies and wacky traps. Throughout the map, you can see these little dudes who are enemies named Sniffits. When I first saw them, I thought they were a weird form of Shy Guy. Playing this map with other players, I really only took my time exploring and checking out the countless details and secrets this map has to offer, other than actually engaging in combat. In fact, throughout the entire match, I only got into one combat engagement on a completely random floor I don't even think I went back to. This really shows how gargantuan this map is, and it can be really fun with a whole server full of players. Considering it's deathmatch after all, you could really do anything you want. Set up a nest at the rooftop theatre? Sure. Heavy stack round each corner, obliterating everything in your path? Absolutely. I could not turn one single corner without the cold sweat I was going to eat a direct rocket to the face. 10 out of 10. Continuing on yet again with a string of recreational game maps, Hotel Hell is a faithful TF2 recreation of the Duke Nukem 3D level of the same name. When I say that these maps carry over the energy of their source material well, I'm definitely not lying, as basically everything about this map is identical to the original level. The textures are perfectly crispy, the layout is spot on, and even the music is on point. As maps like CP Hotel Hell are indeed from other games, the map layout is suited to fit the gameplay style of the original title, and in this case, Duke Nukem 3D is a bloodbath of badass close quarters combat. Therefore, CP Hotel Hell plays exactly how you'd expect, with tight corners and solid points that can completely switch up the game with a single good push. Adding onto this hectic layout is the addition of interactable elevators that can help you get the winning jump on the team clueless that you're about to absolutely know rushing a lot of them back to spawn. Just look at this heavy gameplay I found from 2011, where this mad lad mows down the entire team with one fell swoop. But more about the origins of Hotel Hell, a quick search shows me that the only existing upload is on Game Banana by map developer Jester, submitted on March 31st, 2010. 
The map was pretty populated in its prime, and well received, as we can see with the positive comments on the original upload, as well as a handful of old footage from YouTube from early 2011 leading up to 2012. One outlier, however, is this gameplay from April 2009 on the exact same map, contradicting the 2010 upload date we saw previously on Game Banana. I led this footage back to a comment on the original upload, stating that CP Hotel Hell used to be available on FPS Banana with some minor changes, perhaps signalling a more polished re-upload once FPS Banana had merged into Game Banana around the same time Hotel Hell was uploaded. With this, I can most definitely say that this map is older than it seems, perhaps even being in development around late 2008 if there was a public release available at the time this very footage was recorded. Regardless, CP Hotel Hell remains a classic recreation that definitely had its peak before falling deep into the unknown, sometime shortly afterwards. Although a shame, you could say it was due to the ever-changing climate of map development at the time, as more and more community maps were introduced into the scene, treating players to a wide selection of gameplay at the cost of relevancy. Welcome to DMSDM, standing for Scarlet Devil Mansion. It's a map based off the Toho project, being primarily focused on the main setting from Toho 6, Embodiment of Scarlet Devil, where the mansion's mistress, Romelia Scarlet, casts a spell of crimson mist over the whole region, prompting the protagonist to come in and clear up the mess. This is related to the map, trust me. It is said in the lore that the mansion appears much larger on the inside, due to the manipulation of time and space by the mansion's maid, Sakia. And this is a part of the map that especially holds true, as walking past the fountain into the courtyard and up to the steps leads you into the foyer, where the seamless transition really does make it look smaller from the outside. Pretty genius. This fact is made even clearer by just how much of the mansion the map depicts, with an entire library managed by fairies spanning several stories, a grand staircase with a large portrait of the mansion's mistress, dining rooms, kitchens, a clock tower that actually chimes, and a spooky looking basement where Amelia's powerful sister Flandre is supposedly held captive to restrict her powers. But all it leads to are several doors that bring you to one of her cleverly crafted traps. On my first initial search, I went through only one door, and stumbled into a mess of errors that killed me on contact. But there is more to see here though, which I'll be covering in a little bit. An impressive element of this map shows though, when you consider that the Scarlet Devil Mansion is never properly depicted in its entirety from the media present at the time of the map's creation, prompting the map creator to envision a lot of the aspects of the scenery themselves as they string together what they imagined to be a canon layout. Uploaded to Game Banana by developer Deity Link on November 3rd, 2010, Link describes the map as not necessarily a place designed for professional or competitive play, but rather a style of gameplay seen in maps such as Mario Kart when players can chill, lay back, and play some fun casual matches. I can see why they came to this conclusion, as this map isn't really designed for anything of the serious sort, with its huge winding corridors and spacious areas. DMSDM also holds a surprising amount of secrets, one of which I accidentally stumbled across upon my initial playthrough, but reloading the map back up, I had a second search which showed me a lot more. Going back into the basement, the doors directed me to several places, most of which were exact clones of the hub that I initially walked into. Every now and then, with a specific door, there would be a trap such as Sakia Brando time-stopping and throwing knives at me, pumpkin bombs that would never actually explode, Flandre herself hurling a lance directly at my face impaling me instantly, and what I assume to be Flandre's room where she's imprisoned for eternity. Another interesting discovery was the mapmaker's room, where you can see the progress of the map being developed, as well as the credits for those who contributed towards its submission. Nice. Another early spin of the payload game mode, or rather the payload race game mode, PLR Whale Race is a novel concept that yet again incorporates close quarters team-based encounters into its gameplay, similar to a lot of other community-made maps from the early days of TF2 map development. Whale Race was uploaded to tf2maps.net around Christmas 2009 to a considerably positive reception from players. As the name suggests, the map revolves around the racing of team-coloured whales that move whenever a team member stands on their back, propelling them forward in the same way as a payload cart. But what makes Whale Race so different from the usual payload race game mode is how unique the carts, or rather the whales, move in contrast to their surroundings. What I mean by this is the path the whales take to the capture point is not long or winding in the slightest. Contrasting to the other payload race maps that primarily focus on distance, this means that the whales move much slower even when they're at the maximum speed, prioritising the risk of encounters that come with playing the objective. Wherever you are on the map, the whales are always nearby, therefore the enemies or the teammates trying to capture are in your line of sight at any given moment, making for quick and close engagements that usually result in a combined team push. I absolutely adore this take on the game mode, and adrenaline pumping fast paced take on objective play, rather than trying to see who gets the most kills in a round. I'm looking at you, Hightower. Another way Whale Race does things different is the inclusion of multiple playable areas, meaning that the first capture by a team will not necessarily result in a win, as there is a whole other part of the match yet to be played. In general though, this map is beautiful, with sunny scenery and clean aquatic themes. As a user notes in a recent comment, 
it's nostalgic, and reminds me of simpler times like a day at the beach. And as much as I've never played this map before making this video, I really have to agree. Something about Whale Race just gives me a burst of nostalgia, wishing I'd played this map back when times were simpler. But hey, it's still here, and it plays just as well as it did 13 years ago. Oh yeah, did I mention the giant apocalyptic mother whale that wipes the whole server out once a team reaches the final cap? What a way to end such a happy entry. Following up on our aquatic theme here, CP Aqua is more of a competitive focused classic attack defend map with a definite shift towards more serious pushes and chokes. Submitted by map developer Woodbulb on April 9, 2008, Aqua is a beautifully crafted map that has sadly gone unseen through the years, an unfortunate parallel to how much detail and time had been put into its development. Set in an underwater aquatic research station, you wouldn't believe that Aqua was uploaded in 2008, mere months after the game's release, with how stunning the aesthetics are. Woodbulb perfectly blends the industrial, mechanical feel of a deep sea research station with the thriving scenery of surrounding wildlife and natural elements. But just wait until you see the outdoor beauty of the final control point, as the offensive team moves up and up through the station until they reach the surface. The lighting here is alluring, as it blends the technical look of the station's topside with an earthly landscape that contrasts with the aquatic setting below. Honestly, I'm shocked that this map is obscure as it is, as the balanced layout combined with the attention to detail makes it absolutely memorable. Although at times, Aqua can get confusing with the amount of elevation and closely knit corridors in its layout. From the gameplay I gathered, either team seemed to grasp the map's layout well, but on one occasion I heard an engagement and had to run around for a little while, until I found what my team were fighting. A small nitpick, but as other commenters helpfully pointed out, CP Aqua could use some more direction in its layout in the form of signs, pointing players towards points in active zones. A comment that stuck out to me was a user stating that him and his clan found the map engaging for clan battles back when those were a thing. And that resonated with me. Aqua is the perfect map for those type of scenarios, with its comp focus as well as an overall nostalgic feeling. You'd definitely see a 2009 clan battle here without a doubt. Another CSS map that got a TF2 port, Surf Bathroom is a strange take on Surf that doesn't really add up. Uploaded on February 10th of 2007 by map developer Smooth, over half a year before TF2 would release, I guess you can call Bathroom an early take on combat surfing that went along with a niche of mini-scaled maps that TF2 would see a surge in later down the line. Essentially, Surf Bathroom puts players in, you guessed it, a giant bathroom with an abundance of different items scattered across the arena. There are breakable entities, shampoo bottles, miscellaneous utensils, and a strange collection of bodybuilder magazines everywhere you turn. With the entire map condensed into this single space, Smooth had to get inventive if they wanted their map to seem interesting. Surf Bathroom doesn't actually feature many traditional surfing ramps, rather ledges and angled surfaces that a player could slide down in order to reach the combat area below. Falling into a drain such as the one found in a sink or a bathtub will send you down the drainage system that spits you out at a random location of the map, a novel idea that seems creative, but gets tedious if you'd like to maintain a consistent momentum rather than sit through this drain sequence every time you want to surf. However, bathroom does feature a fun little way to gain speed, as the bathtub surfaces are aligned with conveyors that will accelerate the player round and round until they can fly off anywhere they please hoping the map's spacious sightlines don't get you shot out the air, of course. Other areas of interest are images, like the Spongebob movie poster that was relatively new at the time, and the T and CT signings as well as CSS weapon assets that probably had to be revamped once the map was imported into TF2. Although in my opinion, Bathroom is a map that falls short of its surf aspect and rather focuses on large-scale combat. It is still a fun map that definitely shows its age and its gameplay, as well as its design. CTF for LOLs is a map that I've been looking forward to cover ever since I heard about it from those who played it back in the day, as it is the epitome of old TF2 mapping that to me appears so humble and respectable that playing it today feels like taking a trip into a museum. Being one of the oldest maps on this list, submitted on November 12th, 2007 by developer FPS The Pona around a mere month after TF2 was first released, LOLs is a great take on CTF that provides many gameplay options and ways to approach the objective. Loading in, I could immediately see this map was short and quite literally to the point, with both of the team's spawns directly facing each other obscured by a large centre wall. The inter was placed on top of the spawn itself, meaning players have to navigate right at the heart of the enemy team in order to capture, focusing on dangerous and risky objective plays that requires the strength of the whole team to keep the enemies at bay. Speaking of intel, there are multiple ways to approach the spawns, either going left or right for a straightforward push, going through the buildings on the side, or sneaking under the centre of the map by entering the tunnel through the trench just outside of spawn. Lowell's also has a tendency to provide a wide selection of traditional cover, while still maintaining sightlines for those who wish to play long range. 
Although the sniper towers are quite cheekily placed on either side of a team's spawn, leading to some disastrous spawn camping potential. We can let that slide though. This was an experimental time, and the fact that it holds up this well even with the modern climate of gameplay is incredible map design. To cap it all off, LOLs has no secrets or in-depth stories. Rather, its appearance here is simply a testament to how memorable a map can be, with those fun, fast-paced early memories for some fading into a nostalgia over time. Seeing how LOLs was released practically alongside the game for the most part, it feels to me that these short-range close-quarters based maps faded out as time grew on, with map developers prioritising more unique approaches to the layout of a comp-focused map, rather than a straightforward rush between both teams that takes the core elements of a class, such as a scout's flank or an NG's defence, and puts them into a perfect example of how a class can matter. Our last mention of a Counter-Strike source port, Surf Toast began as a CSS map that arguably had more of an appearance in TF2 than the very game it was developed for. At least that's what I gathered from the handful of TF2 surfing videos on YouTube, compared to the lack of Counter-Strike videos. Originally created by map developer Toast on an unknown date, it was redone by Ryan S and submitted in this new remade form on March 11, 2009. Knowing that this upload is definitely a remake, Surf Toast is 100% older than it appears, perhaps even being created before TF2 was released. There's nothing much to say about the design, or lack thereof, of Surf Toast Redone, as it features grayscale concrete walls with orangey yellow coloured ramps that have more of a focus on course than design. The most notable thing about this map is the combat section, a trademark design with spikes at the bottom of the arena, and rafter-like walkways where the players can battle to the death if they ever fail a ramp. It's hard to say if Surf Toast was one of the first maps to implement this idea, as we don't exactly know the creation date of the original. Otherwise, it's quite a standard map that appears to have held quite a considerable place in Surf Server rotations that has since made it completely redundant by some objectively more complex maps. Our last entry for Tier 5 is a complex and beautifully designed map that has seemingly gone completely under the radar. Even having its own TF2 wiki page for a map that only a couple of YouTube videos and a handful of threads evidence as even existing in the first place. Uploaded by map developer Schmitz to TF2maps.net on March 24, 2009, Meridian is a map that plays the game mode Territorial Control, a controversial game mode that has taken up quite the infamy due to the likes of TC Hydro. However, Meridian does the game mode entirely differently, with the introduction of intelligence to capture rather than control points like the original game mode. Being a five-stage map, the offensive team must collect the intel from within the Reds' territory and bring it back to their home base in order to move on to the next stage, a much more organised and enjoyable way to play territorial control rather than the confusing control point approach. As the TF2 wiki quotes, in almost complete contrast with the length of the stages in Hydro, Meridian's paths for the most part are short, angular, and consist of tight corners mixed with long straight hallways. Combat moves very quickly, and focus shifts from defence to offence almost instantly. Keeping an aggressive playstyle and knowing where your enemy is moving and allocating forces is the key to success. Aesthetically is where this map ultimately excels in my opinion, being set on a tropical island with a large industrial base set up in the island's volcano. The first stage starts out in a tropic looking native village, where blues spawn and must progress further into the volcanic base to obtain all five of the red intelligence briefcases. My personal favourite part of this map is the second stage, where the red base houses this massive badass looking robot that was my immediate sightseeing stop judging from the pictures on the download page. I just think all this technical machinery juxtaposes the natural feel of the island so well that it creates a contrast between not only the aesthetic of the map but also the teams, where we can see the red is trying to protect their home base and blue is perhaps a force trying to keep the peace of the island. I don't know, just putting it out there. In terms of Meridian success, it's unfortunate that along with the territorial control game mode, the map fell under in terms of players, into an eventual memory of the past as territorial control was pushed aside for more favourite game modes. I think judging territorial control as a whole, just from how Hydro turned out, isn't the way to go, as Meridian plays as a great blend between the classic CTF game mode and the experimental feel of TC. But at the end of the day, maybe TF2's overarching style of gameplay just didn't shape up to include TC as a game mode that would remain memorable. Well, we've made it to tier 6, the bottom of the deep, the darkest and lowest tier. From here on out, we can only expect the most obscure and eerily unknown maps we've seen yet. Our first entry is Koth Yop A1, an alien specimen of a map that induces a fear of an all-seeing omnipotent force in players, a force further amplified by a deafening silence it emits with powerful volume. But what exactly is Koth Yop in its simplest form? Well, Yop takes the engineer and accords him godlike power 
including the ability to create a pocket dimension of his own creation. Any player who is unfortunate enough to stumble into this map will be trapped in eternal torment of engineered textures on every surface at any turn. The sky is solely composed of engineer apparitions, blessed with a glow of power, and rotating at consistent yet nausea-inducing speeds, round and round with no end. Players will spawn in a tiny engineer box suspended in the air, giving somewhat of a retreat to those who have experienced what is beyond the spawn door. Only a rocket separates the parallel distance between the two team spawns, with the point directly underneath. A minuscule amount of space is offered to do battle, with a small enclosure on either side for a team to ready their defences. To make matters more degrading, however, the only spacious area players can truly rid themselves of the claustrophobia is a sea of gerati, coating them in a sulfuric yellow tint, adding a degree of mockery to the nightmare. But clearly the most insanity-inducing element of this map is... the silence. What do I mean by the silence? The TF2 matches not make a lot of noise? Weapon sounds, voice commands, even map ambience? No, because Kothi Yarp A1 removes each and every possible way to make noise, leaving you trapped in a silent chamber of evil. Genuinely, the clip I'm about to play is indeed real audio from playing this map. There is not even a peep to be heard. To me, this is perhaps the most eerie thing about this map. Something about taking away the comfortable chaos of noise we're so familiar with even for a joke gives a sense of uncertainty none of us are used to. And when the point is captured, your hats will grow in size which, admittedly, can be a bit funny. When I say though that Coffee Up has little to no trace of existence online whatsoever, it's definitely the truth, as I can't even tell you the exact date it was submitted, if it even had an online submission in the first place. Googling the file name turns up only two results with the first one being a somethingawful.com thread detailing map rotations with Kothiup A1 present in the list. The second result gives me a tf2maps.net thread proposing a popular maps night with no mention of Kothiup at all on any page, confusing me as to why it prompted Google to give me the result in the first place. Although there is a trail we can follow to determine the face behind the map. The spawn room has a quote urging players to visit tf2maps.net for more cool maps potentially signalling the original location that this map was uploaded, and maybe even explaining why Google gave me a TF2 maps thread as one of its results. But the most shocking revelation comes when we view the map developer's signature on one of the spawn walls, leading us to discover that popular creator Egan was behind this all along. If you don't remember from earlier, Egan was the ambitious developer behind Watergate and the eventual player destruction game mode. Knowing that Yup was indeed developed by such a prestigious name, perhaps Egan made Yup for a joke, or pulled it offline shortly after its creation, for being so absolutely absurd in contrast to his other more serious work. Welcome to Trade Fligu Gigu, with its name based on the section from the ever so popular Tenacious D song tribute. The song's been witness to a new era, if you will, of popularity being the basis for the weird face funny TikTok trend, where people make strange faces to go along with a song. We've all seen it, but what does this have to do with a map? Well, just imagine a waking nightmare where the weird face funny memes are plastered all over the walls of a hellish landscape. That's trade fligu gigu for ya. Sporting interesting elements, such as the I baked you a pie tunnel, as well as the centerpiece fligu gigu castle, there's something for everyone on this map. There's even some nature to provide a sense of relaxation amidst the worst place you've ever been. Eerily, the only mention of this map's existence online is a 47 view YouTube video in 240p featuring a lone soldier traversing hell itself, attempting to find some sort of meaning to the madness. Looking at the uploader however, it's revealed that they were the ones behind this map all along. Naturally, I had to get into contact to uncover the enigmatic reason for this map's existence. Unfortunately for me, it seems the creator never responded to my messages, leaving this rabbit hole unsolved. A map with an extensive history, but no name behind its original upload, Achievement Idol 4chan began as a small achievement farming map with the ever so familiar nostalgic 4chan map design we've all seen previously with works such as Xenon's Harbour Hotel. The only existing copy of this map online is a garysmod.org re-upload from around 2015, with a download count of only 2 downloads as well as 9 total views. It's safe to say this map went completely unseen, and the true scope of its history has been completely lost to time, because as I said, this is a re-upload, and the original could go as far back as 2007 if we analyse the design of this map. But what you're seeing here is not the original, as the owner of the Deserum Revival project, bringing back the old Harbour Hotel 24-7 server, decided to see if he could revamp this map into a playable time capsule that works with the most recent build of the game. Upon downloading it, he discovered nearly every texture to be lost, 
a consequence of not correctly packing custom textures into a map file, the fault of whoever was behind the original upload of Achievement Idol 4chan. So out of curiosity, server owner Lolwatt would boot up Hammer Editor to decompile what little he had to find out that many of the textures were ones used by Xenon in the creation of his own maps. Thus, Lolwatt would take to recycling these textures into the missing gaps, miraculously resolving the issue. However, there remained three spots where the textures must have been completely custom, getting Lolwatt to contact a mutual friend of Xenon to see if he had any copies of the texture files in his hard drive, unfortunately proving fruitless. So Lolwatt took it upon himself to modify the map slightly, replacing the remaining missing textures with his own that would still remain consistent with the art style of the original map. He then renamed the map to Achievement Idol 4chan Fixed, and upload it to his other server where it remains in the map rotation to this day. The design of this map is exactly what you'd expect from a 4chan map, featuring many familiar textures from other maps of the same calibre, and a linear map layout that doesn't offer much space to roam around very much. In spawn, you'll take constant damage where you can exit to the right in the main stretch, or break this wall on your left leading to your death. There's not much of the centre of this map other than a Shinji cube that kills on contact moving in a rectangular pattern. Outside of every team's spawn, there are about a dozen sentries for which purpose they serve, I have no idea. Most likely achievement farming. Other than that, there's a secret passageway in a corner that sends you spiralling down a flashing red chute, and a teleporter close to spawn that puts you in a flashing red box of water, both, again, leading to your death. And finally, no clipping under the map will bring you to a spacious pool of water with a strange green tint. I really don't have the slightest explanation for this map's meaning, but it's 4chan, make of it what you will. And at last, our final entry for this iceberg is one that I've been keeping until the end for a very good reason. For all of the maps I've covered so far, there's been some sort of reasonable explanation for its existence. But 9612 is a map which really has no reason to exist whatsoever. And if it does, we'll basically never know why. To follow along closely with the mystery of its backstory, 9612 is a map that is not small in the slightest. In fact, it's considerably large, with many different strange areas to explore that serve no purpose at all. But before we delve into the inner workings of this map, let me first tell you exactly why it's here and how we found it. Amongst the assistance I received for the creation of this chart and the gathering of the maps, user Samanuo told me they had a large map folder full of maps from all throughout the years, and the main pick they alerted me of was a map that appeared without any explanation at all. I'm not trying to get this to sound like a cheap creepypasta, because it is true that Samanuo found 9612 in their folder with practically no recollection of downloading it or having it be there in the first place. With an elusive name as well as an uncanny screenshot to go alongside it, I decided to play 9612 going in completely blind to see if the map itself was worth its novel backstory. Upon loading in, I was placed in a marble room with a tiled floor that matches the team's colour. I knew this map had an unfamiliar dark concrete atmosphere, telling from this one sole screenshot I was predisposed to before joining. My immediate thoughts were that this map definitely did fit the ambience I was expecting it to, with a low quality nighttime city skybox present through the windows of the spawn room giving me that silent dead of night feeling. Before stepping out though, I noticed two distinct doorways on either side of the spawn, one with a wireframe design and the other a bland concrete wall. I thought the wireframe door was a good first pick, and what I emerged into was a huge change in atmosphere to what I thought I'd been loaded into, a neon coloured room that seemingly had no escape, but after colliding with every wall, one of them collapsed, leading it into a massive open space with the same design. For what purpose this serves, I wouldn't know. It could be a different space to fight in, since the wall rooms are reminiscent of traditional spawns. It could be a stretch, but there really wasn't much here, so I killbinded back to where I started. Our second doorway led to another main part of the map. Instead this time, this area was way more accessible and spacious. Right in the centre of these buildings was a strange pale structure that almost looked like a prison with the way it had a main courtyard and towers. Going inside, there were dozens of corridors, all of them empty, with staircases that led to more desolate rooms with decaying colours. This structure kept wrapping around like a maze, so I decided to take my leave and explore the perimeter of buildings. What I found first was a replica of the Temple of Time, looking like a church laying on the outskirts. The atmosphere inside was impressive, accurately depicting the marble surfaces and lights shining through the windows. There was nothing much else there though, so I moved ahead. It was then that I noticed the moon from Majora's Mask just watching the map from above. Creepy yeah, but I found it pretty cool nonetheless. I found another structure that looked like a subway station, and below was a room that you could tell was similar to something you'd find in a trade map. There was also this useless contraption where hitting these lights would flick on rectangles on a metal surface. It had to be there for something, probably old or broken, but it still puzzled me. I walked back up to the surface where I took a right through this combine looking gate. It led me to a view of the first area of the map where the spawn room is located, situated from a height where you could see most of the scenery. A cool little area that didn't really hold much more of a reason to be there. The final thing I found in the concrete area was another gate on the opposite wall that led to a forest. 
It was empty, apart from a small camping setup. Again, I found nothing else, so I killbinded. Finally, I decided to explore the first rooftop area of the map by going through the big spawn door that I took every route around since I loaded in. What I found was a neat area where you could jump from roof to roof, most likely a hub most trade maps have, where players can fight each other directly outside their spawns and go elsewhere to trade or explore. The biggest thing though was this huge concrete floating island-like structure with a bunch of small UFO looking platforms surrounding it. This was the place I was looking out from prior, and there seems to be no other way inside other than the entryway in the concrete area. What stuck out about this island though is that it looked really weird, like it had been cut off from a larger structure that maybe ascended higher into the sky. And well, that's all I could find for 9612, in actual gameplay anyway, as a cheeky no-clip journey took me out of bounds into this one-to-one -one replica of Pallet Town from the Gen 1 Pokemon games. It had the layout, the textures, everything. There's probably a way to access this, but in my thorough search, I never ended up finding anything. Concluding my findings, I can say that 9612 appears to be the remnants of a trade map, maybe one in development that never got released, or a smaller area of a larger map. One thing I can say for certain is that the name 9612 is most likely a date, either being the 6th of September 2012 or the 9th of June depending on where you're from. All in all, I'd say this was the ultimate mystery to conclude our chart on. So, we've really reached the bottom. From clear skies of the most well-known maps TF2 has ever seen, to some truly bizarre maps that have never seen the light of day. This video has been such an extensive undertaking, and has proved to be my biggest project, I think, ever. It has taken me many, many months to perfect this project, with hours upon hours of script writing, footage filming, and editing. I really hope you all enjoyed this video, whether you have left it on while doing some work, or had a dedicated TF2 movie night. I can't thank you enough for being such a loyal audience. I also want to give another huge thanks to those who helped me create this video and tagged along for the ride. Lolwat, the Deserum Revival and Internet Fine Machine servers, everyone who helped me contribute towards the chart, and all of the players who joined to help me record footage. You can probably spot yourself somewhere in the video. Thank you also to all of the creators in which I've featured footage or media from, and to you guys who helped keep the history of this game alive. Anyone who I credited, you can probably spot your names in the credits that are rolling as I speak. And you, viewer, thank you in particular for making it this far into the video. I could never have dreamed of such a privilege to be able to provide content of this calibre for you when I was such a minuscule content creator. As always, this has been Tofanator, and I'll see you all very soon.